making some time in a what is always a busy time here as we approach the holidays. We really appreciate the effort everyone put to come in and joining us for the 2018 Quality Improvement Summit um, that's put on by the uh, Quality Improvement and Patient Safety Committee of the AUA. Today's topic, as I know you're all aware, is opioid stewardship in urology. Um, I'm Greg Offenberg. I'm a urologic oncologist at Northwestern. I'm one of the co-chairs of today, today's event uh, in conjunction with Angie Smith, who's sitting right here from the University of North Carolina. We've had the pleasure uh, over about the last year of uh, working to put together the panel of speakers that we've assembled today, and we're really ecstatic at the, the people who have been gracious enough to join us to share their expertise with us on this topic. And um, we're excited to sort of hear from them and learn from them, but also to learn from all of our attendees who are not uh, on the speaker agenda, because this is something that I think everyone has some perspective on and something that we can all learn from. So uh, again, we're very happy that you're all here. Um, I'm just going to provide a brief sort of introduction to the day, as well as some um, sort of uh, more programmatic or system things that will get us through the day. And then from there, I'll turn it over to our speakers. So first of all, welcome. Um, as I sort of already said, we're really excited about today. There's been a lot of enthusiasm about this topic. We have over 100 registered attendees today, 26 of whom are trainees, which is also extremely exciting as sort of the, the next generation of urology comes up to see their interest in this topic. We're representing 30 states, the District of Columbia, and several Canadians are here too, so a very wide geographic spread especially those of you who have come all the way from the West Coast. Uh, we appreciate you, you joining us. Um, the topic today, as, as we've said, is opioid stewardship in, in urology. Um, and a couple questions we'll answer here if this will stop advancing on me is, you know, first, why are we here? Um, sort of big picture, this summit is the, the fourth uh, of these that's been put on by the Quality Improvement Patient Safety Committee. They're, they're annual functions with the goal to select a topic that's pertinent to urologists um, and um, bring together experts in the field of urology but also outside of urology to share their perspectives as we work to, to define uh, a way forward for our specialty and perhaps others to um, sort of improve on a, a focused topic that, that is relevant to those uh, practicing our specialty. So why this topic, and, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time diving into the impact of the ongoing opioid epidemic in this country. I think everyone has heard plenty about it, and, and several of our speakers will very wonderfully delineate the impact of this. But this is obviously a very timely, uh, significant issue, uh, um, and um, something that I, I think as surgeons we, we deal a lot with pain control, pain medicines, and um, I think uh, there are ample opportunities for us to learn from one another to try and optimize our potential impact or ultimately have a more positive impact on, the, on, this, tro on this troubling issue. The goals of today's summit are, are really to just bring people together to start to talk about this, to share experiences, share research and ideas. Uh, ultimately, we will be putting together the proceedings of this to be disseminated across the AUA to people that aren't here uh, in person. Um, today's proceedings are recorded and actually will be put up online um, for uh, AUA members to view as well, and these will be written up. Um, and then ultimately, hopefully, um, much of the work today can be integrated in some way into action, whether that's in individual practice or through relationships that are formed today, people that can go on and continue to do uh, important work uh, to move the needle forward uh, on this issue. So those are our goals for today. The agenda, uh, which you can see here, is, is quite packed. Um, we have a great panel of speakers. We, we will start with our keynote, um, and I'll introduce our keynote speaker here soon, uh, who's going to be speaking on the role of acute care prescribing in the opioid epidemic. After that, we have several sessions, each of which has um, three speakers who will speak for about 20 minutes, uh, with some time for questions for each speaker at the end. Um, so from there, we will focus on physician-led multi-component interventions and opioid stewardship. After that, uh, understanding post-operative pain. Uh, we will then have a panel of several urologists um, that's moderated by uh, Tudor Borza talking about uh, urology perspectives and sort of a case-based model, uh, talking through challenging cases that people have encountered, and hopefully that will be uh, an interactive session for all of us. We have a 
you'll notice rather brief lunch break, 15 minutes to run out and grab your lunch. And then uh, we're going to plan to work through lunch um, with sort of more continued uh, urologic perspectives. We, we have several research scholars, our resident and fellow scholars who are here with us today. We're going to ask some of them to share their perspectives, what's going on at their institution. Um, and also make time for, for anyone else that, that has any insights that they'd like to share uh, as we sort of eat and talk at the same time. Uh, after that, we will be hearing from several speakers on high-risk patients and managing expectations, and then following, closing out the day with several talks on sort of policy and outreach work that's going on in this space uh, that's been led by physicians. And then we'll close out the day uh, about 3.30 few housekeeping things. So first of all, um, we hope to have a very interactive day. Uh, we really ask everyone to participate both in person and as you see here, if you're a, a Twitter person, uh, we've got a hashtag for the day and encourage people to participate both in the room and, and beyond. You'll see there are microphones at several points throughout. Um, really heavily encourage people if they can, if they have a question, to please get up and use the microphones um, for a couple reasons. One of which is, again, this is being recorded. Um, and will be planned to be disseminated more widely. And if we're not talking in the microphones, we may not be able to pick up the questions as well. So please uh, do your best to make use of that. Um, we have already touched on the working lunch. Restrooms are outside and to the left. Um, because the agenda is so packed, there may not be a ton of formal breaks, but feel free if you need to get up and head out or, or um, sort of refresh your coffee. Um, transportation, the, there are shuttles, there's shuttle schedules that are likely in the materials that were disseminated up front. If not, on one of the breaks, one of the AUA staff can uh, help you uh, understand that. Sort of near the end of the day, there will be a couple of shuttle runs back to the, the airport and I believe also to the hotel. Um, but also if you need to leave early or off hours, the, um, some of the staff members who are walking around would be happy to help you uh, make tra travel arrangements to get back to the airport or the train station. Um, Wi-Fi is available. It's a little tricky to get on. The network is guessed. If, you, if it's not working, we just learned this in the back, turn your Wi-Fi off and turn it back on. Then go to your web browser, try and open up a web page, and that's where you put in that password. So that's how that works. Um, this is a, an event that is eligible for CME credit. Um, all attendees will get a follow-up email in the coming days that explains how to um, register and obtain that credit. Uh, I think there are some questions that need to be answered and then I, I believe it's a little over seven hours of CME available for this uh, conference. And then the last thing is we will be making use uh, or some of our speakers of the um, audience response system with, with Pull Everywhere. So this is something where um, there, some of our speakers have integrated questions into their talks um, and are asking for participation in sort of a poll-like manner. So in order to participate, if you have a cell phone, um, it explains it here, but basically you send a text to this 22333 uh, with the username Urology. Um, and then after you've joined the session, um, you're kind of up and going. And for the questions that come up, um, basically you send a text back to that number, um, you know, listing the sort of answer choice that you select when, when times have come. Uh, to address some of these questions, and ultimately it will appear somewhat like this. So I believe, is this, this is a live test one right now? Yes. Uh, all right. So if we, can we pull that back up or? So you want us to do a test run now? All right. So our question today is, why are you taking this course? And obviously, you can see your answer choices there. All right, great. Well, so we'll plan to make use of that, as I said, at various points throughout the day with some of our speakers asking um, perhaps slightly more interesting questions than this. But uh, it'll be good to see those results. So um, before we move a little further into the day, just want to um, quickly acknowledge a few folks who have made this day possible. First of all, the AUA Board of Directors and the AUA at large uh, for um, its sponsorship of this event. Um, that specifically is coming through the Quality Improvement and Patient Safety Committee. We have two of the leaders of that committee, Tim Average and, and Matt Nielsen, here with us today, and we're really appreciative of 
you know, their ability to, to allow us to plan this and, and pull off this event. There's been a innumerable number of AUA staff members who have helped us put this together. Um, several who are named here, Jennifer Birch, Suzanne Pope, um, Kaylee Johnson, and, and many more have really been instrumental to our planning process, getting everyone here and making arrangements for the day. So we're very thankful to them as well. Um, before we move into the agenda, I'm happy if there are any questions to take a brief minute and address those and then we'll move on. Okay. So um, given that, without much further ado, we will jump into the, the agenda for the day. And I, I, it's a distinct pleasure to um, introduce to the group our, our keynote speaker who is uh, Dr. Chad Brummett. Um, Chad is a anesthesiologist and pain specialist from the University of Michigan. He serves as the director of the Division of Pain Research. He's the director of clinical research in the Department of Anesthesiology at Michigan. He also um, is one of three co-directors, of which we're fortunate to have two of the three with us here today, of a initiative um, that has the name the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network, or an MOPEN. This is an organization that was founded in 2016. It has rapidly evolved in size and number of participants to be a truly just unbelievable initiative that is a leader in the area of post-operative pain. It works on a statewide level across Michigan to gather data and really pragmatically implement change in an amazing way to transform surgical pain management uh, and address the opioid epidemic on multiple levels. So um, as a result, it's my pleasure to introduce Chad, who's going to speak to us about some of the work they're doing in Michigan and um, the epidemic at large. So thanks, Chad. Thanks, Chad. Good morning. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? So I want to make one modification to the agenda. Um, Brooke's here. Um, she's another anesthesiologist. We're going to break each other out for lunch. So we're each going to have a half an hour lunch while the urologists work right through. Uh, <laughs> I always insist that there's at least one other anesthesiologist. We had the same thing. Uh, Jonah was there for the American College of Surgeons. We did the same thing at the American College of Surgeons meeting. So thank you for bringing a second anesthesiologist to help me out. <laughs> I'm going to be talking and trying to put, a, um, put everything that we're going to talk about today in context. I am certainly going to overlap with some of the speakers later, and I'm, cert I'm not trying to steal thunder or uh, really take away from those lectures because I think that many of the topics that I'll touch on that are also going to be discussed later, including some of the work from my colleagues, uh, Jim Dupree and Jen Walji, will be good to hear twice and good to hear from two different perspectives. Uh, more importantly, I want to just say that I'm humbled to be here and to be giving this keynote because I recognize right now that there are many in this room that have made valuable contributions to this space, I, I, I look at Rick Barth and realize that the Dartmouth group has really been out front and done a lot of this work. It's, it's really funny how we've gone back and forth and we write a paper only to find out that uh, Rick and his team have already published it in Annals of Surgery the month prior. And so we're, we're really um, humbled to be here and describing our effort. Um, just some housekeeping. Uh, these are our funding sources. We have some grants from the NIH that do fund our work. We have substantial funding from Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, SAMHSA, and CDC. Uh, some institutional funding, we've actually, uh, one of the areas where I'm really proud is, is at, about Michigan is, is that we really get behind research and support it in a robust way. Um, I have some research that is funded by Neuros Medical, not related to today. I have a patent that will never pay me a dollar in my life, which is sad, but um, I, I just close it anyway. And I, I consult for two companies that make non-opioid analgesics. I will not discuss their products today, but I will say I, I'm, I'm bullish on innovation around non-opioid analgesics, especially as it relates to acute pain. I started giving this lecture probably about three years ago. And at that time, I would say 78 Americans die every day from opioid-related overdose. And that seems shocking, trying to put that into context, trying to think about planes crashing each week. And then it was 91 the next year, 115 until just recently where the 2017 data so not even data from today came out suggesting that 134 Americans die every day from opioid-related overdose. And it's one thing to actually talk about the numbers and acknowledge that this is rampant, and certainly those numbers shock, but I bring it back to the stories because unfortunately as I've traveled, I hear stories. I know there are stories in this room today um, and some that I haven't heard. 
but one that stands out today is, is, is my colleague Mario, who lost his son in the spring. His son was a really handsome young man, uh, well-liked by his friends, well-supported by his family, hockey player, hockey-related injury, no surgery, but very well could have been, and had his first opioid exposure from that musculoskeletal injury. He had dealt with anxiety throughout much of his life. And he knew in that moment that he liked opioids. It's just that no one other than his little brother knew that he liked opioids. When that opioid supply was gone, he started getting opioids from his house cleaner. Bringing it back to that narrative today, even though he was never cared for by a surgeon, I'm certain that some of those pills that his house cleaner brought in were from excess surgical prescribing. The data are pretty clear. He moved down a path of heroin, in and out of rehabilitation, his father spending more than six figures caring for him and trying to put him through. And I've had many conversations with his father. Uh, we work together now. They've, we've created a new Families Against Narcotics chapter in Ann Arbor area. And he talks about how every single text finished with, I love you, Dad. Thanks for all that you've done for me. Appreciative, loving. Certainly, he tells the stories of the frustrations and the ups and downs. But I love you, Dad. Thank you so much for what you've done for me. And then in a presentation that he and I did together recently, he had a colleague read his last text, the text that said, I've slipped again, Dad. I need to get this out of my system. I'm so sorry. Thank you for all that you've done for me. I love you. He then talks about driving around the mountain area that he was in looking for cell coverage because he had a missed call from a sheriff, knowing at that point that his son had experienced a fatal overdose. And those are the stories. And so as we talk today, I want you to be woken up by that story. I want you to feel personally responsible for that story. I am part of the opioid epidemic. My well-intended care has led to the opioid epidemic. I was taught just give them enough so they don't run out. I probably taught people, just give them enough so they don't run out. If you have real pain, you cannot be addicted. I was taught that, and I'm certain I taught it to others. I perpetuated that false term, the made-up term of pseudo-addiction. It's not a real word. Turns out addiction is addiction. So I've contributed to it, but I think what's great about today and what you're going to see throughout today, because I've already talked to a lot of the speakers, and I know what you're going to see, and it's exciting, is that as compared to being a psychiatrist or dealing with addiction or a policymaker trying to figure out what to do about these overdoses and fentanyl, you're in a space today where change is possible. Actually, change is easy. We had a neurosurgeon come up to me after one of my lectures, and he said, you know, I don't, Chad, I don't want to insult you, but it's kind of simple. And I think if you know our group, you know we love simple, and we love that opportunity. And while I'm sort of maybe more of a traditional nerd in my research, I've really embraced quality improvement and understand that well, it's simple, but it's not that simple, right? When you dig underneath and you start to do the real work to make change, there's secret sauce. And I think you're going to see that today, and I think there's opportunity. If we go back to the peak of prescribing, 2010, 2011, we constituted 4% of the world's population, and yet we consumed 80% of the world's opioids. Now, I'm boarded in pain medicine, and I can say with the greatest certainty that that vast overuse of opioids did not lead to better pain care. No doubt it's led to morbidity and mortality. In fact, while I do prescribe opioids for patients with chronic pain, and it's a small number, really the evidence for opioids for chronic pain is poor at best. There are some people that benefit, picking them out is hard, but there's no question this is not an evidence-based approach to pain management. Now, we've seen year over year since 2010, 2011, a decrease, 2016 to 2017, these data are a few months old, also showed that decrease, and while we saw that decrease in prescribing, we also saw a number of other factors. Every single state saw a decrease in prescription, less new starts, and more people moving below that threshold of 90 oral morphine equivalents that the CDC put forward as a threshold of too much. So these are all positive things, but certainly, and we may have advocates in the room today. We may have patient advocates in the room. I don't know. 
but um, you know, we'll see this. And if I, if I even take it out another year, when we, if we added this year's CDC data, that discrepancy between the decrease in prescribing and the increase in mortality would only be greater. And so we'll have people come back and say, well, this is evidence that opioid prescribing and overdose are not linked. I think that that is as challenging as making the argument here, looking at the full picture, that our increase in prescribing that started in the early 90s wasn't associated, right? I, I, got, a, I got an epidemiology lesson on Twitter uh, about causation. I thanked them for their, um, their correction and said that in the early 90s, we, early to mid 90s, we had an increase in prescribing and we had an incredibly well associated increase in mortality to follow this continued. And we'll keep going up. I mean, there's some signs in 2018 that we might be peaking, maybe. We're still high. I mean, that's still, you know, we're going to be in the 140s, 150s, right? And then we might, be, we might be on our way down. But this is driven by fentanyl. And not fentanyl from the ORs, but fentanyl from the Walter Whites of the world that have learned how to make it in their kitchens. This is heroin. As heroin's become cheaper, it's become the alternative for people who can't get their pills anymore. And I, won't, I, don't, I don't actually agree with the narrative that because we're prescribing less pills, we're pushing people to heroin. We can talk about that. We can talk about it as it relates to acute pain and chronic pain. But certainly for what you do, the fact that you're prescribing less pills does not mean you're making people use heroin. Reject that narrative. We know, though, the current data suggests that 80% of the people who start down the path of heroin begin with a prescription pill. Again, what will people come back and say, well, many times that's those are pills not prescribed to them. Yeah, but they're still prescribed. And if you're prescribing in excess, you're contributing to that path towards heroin. There is a link between opioid prescribing and opioid overdose. These are the data that just came out last week from the CDC. Uh, as they break it down by age category, you see every single age category increasing. What's really striking is the number of young people dying. Right now, if you're under 55, the number one cause of death is overdose, and that's almost all driven by opioids. This is the third year in a row where we have seen a decrease in life expectancy in the US. The last time we saw that, it was heroic. I just went through a World War II museum or a World War II display when I was in Chicago. We show pictures of young men going off to war it's heroic and you know, I, I just don't believe that when we come back 50 years from now, we're gonna be offering the same sort of eulogies for the many young men and women who have died today. This is a very different time, but it is the first time since World War II that we've seen that decrease life expectancy. Now our group started like most groups, we, we started down the path of saying, well, if we could compare opioid users to those not using, what's happening, and especially if we think about quality. And this was led by one of our uh, medical students who's now an intern at, at um, Harvard in surgery. We looked at patients in the MSQC. We looked at patients who had either been on an opioid before their surgery or not. And after adjusting for all the factors that had previously been associated with cost, morbidity, and utilization, just being categorized as an opioid user was associated with a $2,300 increased cost increased utilization, longer length of stay, more readmissions, and more morbidity, surgical site infections, sepsis, et cetera. And this seemed like an opportunity. And in fact, um, I, said, I said at that time, we're gonna come back to this. It might be five years from now. We're already back to this. I'm not gonna talk about it today, but this might be an opportunity for quality improvement. But I'll caution you just to say, um, we have really very little evidence that weaning people before surgery will will directly address these associated morbidity and cost measures. There may be good reasons to wean, there may be other reasons to wean, but we have a lot we don't know about weaning. And so at that time, our, our group sort of said, hey, look, everybody's focused on all the downstream effects, what to do with chronic pain, what to do with medication-assisted treatment, opioid overdose, but at the time, other than a few small groups, very few people were talking about this. If we're gonna have a comprehensive narrative around opioids, shouldn't we also be looking at those patients not using opioids and think about shepherding those patients through a path that not only decreases their risk, 
but the risk of the people that they interact with, their families, their friends, their neighbors, the people that come in and out of their house. And what's interesting about surgery in particular is that the exposures are predictable. If I try to do a, a, a study of opioid use or new exposures in a medicine clinic, I would sit there and wonder who's going to get an opioid. But Jen Walji led a study that showed it's pretty clear for surgery who's going to get an opioid. It's, it's, it's driven by two factors if you're, if you're not taking opioids. It's the surgery you're having and the surgeon caring for you. Those are the two factors. There's almost no patient level variance. I'm surgeon X, I'm doing surgery Y, and I always give this many pills for this case. I have a one size fits all approach. So I could replace with the dentistry, oral surgery. These are predictable exposures. And this is an opportunity for a preventative narrative. And we all know that prevention is the best way forward if we're thinking about a comprehensive narrative. Now, we also know that surgery is becoming a bigger contributor to new exposures. We looked at data from Truven 2010 to 2017. Truven is a nationally representative uh, private payer database. And what we found was that over this time, on the yellow there, that sort of represents all others, which is mainly primary care physicians. When we looked at opioid naive people who got a new opioid prescription, the relative contribution of surgery was increasing and dentistry as well. As primary care physicians, and this is the preamble to the CDC guidelines, this is even before the CDC guidelines, so my sense is, is that discrepancy is only growing, right? But that we see that as primary care physicians are prescribing less, the relative contribution of surgery is going up. Moreover, if we look at that same seven year period, the amount prescribed by surgeons went up in, in an incredible fashion. Really amazing. While um, you know, every single group increased, if we look at the last three years in particular, primary care physicians at the bottom started not only to prescribe less, but they also prescribed less opioid per prescription. Whereas surgeons, dentists, and emergency room physicians either stayed flat or went up slightly. Why? Well, we haven't had evidence. I'm actually not here to judge you today. I'm not here to tell you what you've done wrong. Right? I'm, I'm here to tell you that with, with a lack of evidence and a lack of focus, there wasn't really anything. How many of you actually read the CDC guidelines? Not, well, that's a, you guys are like a, a really educated group because usually I'll get like two hands in an audience this size, right? The, the reality is that the CDC guidelines have effectively one or two lines about acute pain that say prescribe the minimum amount possible for the shortest time, for the shortest duration. That's effectively what it says, right? Okay. That's like the cardiology consult before an anesthetic. It says don't let the patient get hypoxic or tachycardic or hypotensive. Well, thanks, I really appreciate it. It's, it's very practical. So, so you know, we haven't had guidelines to drive this, so these findings aren't surprising, but they do point to the problem that, that while we focus so much on chronic pain and primary care, we have not given enough focus to surgery. Now, this anesthesiologist is gonna tell you surgeons what you're thinking, <laughs> except that I think the same things. I'm a pain physician. I still do a little clinical care. But I worry about these same things. I worry about time. I think about patient satisfaction. I worry about cost and burden to our clinic, phone calls. These are all things that we know through qualitative data that Jen's run. You know, we understand that this has driven prescribing. I'm worried about satisfaction. I'm worried about phone calls. And so I'm going to prescribe more. Well, this is not an evidence-based activity. Right now, these are two publications, but there's been many since, not just from our group. Brian Bateman has shown this in women undergoing cesarean section. There is no association between the number of pills prescribed and patient satisfaction with their care, nor is there an association between the number of pills prescribed and the likelihood that they're going to call for refill. Let's unpack that. Are people ever dissatisfied? Definitely. Do they ever go to Yelp to complain about you? For sure. But if we actually look at data and determine whether your opioid prescribing is actually driving that, the answer is no, right? You're interested in satisfaction in your clinic? Flip it around. Start treating your patients like customers. Start thinking about it as a restaurant or a hotel, and when they walk in, treat them like customers. For those that have been to Ann Arbor before, we have a very famous deli, Zingerman's. When you walk into Zingerman's, you get a, you get a different feel. It's kind of like, oh, this is different, you know? Every, there's two things that are different. Everybody treats you better, and the prices are a lot higher. But, um, but the, the reality is, is that it's, it's, they have a 
they also have a customer service training. We've done this in our pain clinic. Our pain clinic is non-incentivized. We're the only non-incentivized group in Southeast Michigan, and we do a lot of opioid weaning. And yet, where we used to hover in the mid-80s, through six years of focus on customer service training and culture building, our last patient engagement survey had us at a 99.7% patient rating. That's incredible. I always wanted a six point modifier just to be able to get into the eek end of the low 90s. We did that through customer service training, not through an oxycodone Pez dispenser at the lobby, right? This is, this is done through the hard work of focusing on people and treating patients like customers. In the same way, when we look at refills, well, refills happen. In fact, uh, again, most of these studies Jen has led, 7% of people undergoing abdominal surgery will call for refill. But it doesn't matter whether we look at the equivalent of less than six pills or more than 60, the line is flat. We just got data from spine surgery, the line is flat. We have data that are unpublished from knee and hip replacement, the line is flat. Prescribing more isn't precluding. In fact, if anything, we're maybe seeing a slight tip up at the far right end of that, of that graph. You might be getting people tolerant and predisposing them to calling for refills. You're not changing their refill rate. Now, we were interested in refills, we were interested in satisfaction, but when we really started, I, I must admit this was, this was the area that I was most interested. How often does that person coming in, that healthy person not using opioids come in and leave newly dependent, not necessarily addicted, but dependent on opioids, new chronic user, new persistent user, prolonged persistent user. We've been forced to use many different terms by reviewers. Concept is the same. And this was probably the article where we got the biggest splash, 6% of people, both minor and major surgeries, with no difference between a minor case, a lap coli or a hemorrhoid, versus an open hysterectomy or an open colectomy, the rate was the same. I wasn't surprised by that because in the year prior, we had, um, using prospectively collected data from, a, from an R01, we had used the gold standard measure after knee and hip replacement Pro prospectively, pre-op, six months later, 4% of the hip replacements and 8% of the knees kept using. These are where we've actually calling them. We know that they're using their opioids. We didn't ask at time ask them why. That's changed, we've, we've, we've learned. But there was no association between whether their knee got better or worse or stayed the same and that likelihood of new chronic use. So why? Why are people using opioids chronically? Well, we certainly think that in the preamble of the CDC guidelines and other things, Primary care physicians have done better. They're prescribing less. And so people might now be using, when you prescribe for acute pain, I've got knee pain, and I start to use it for my knee pain, but the long-term data aren't there, right? But when that patient calls for refill, I'm gonna guess that most people make the assumption it's for surgical pain, and maybe it's a mix. We think people are using it for other pain conditions. Certainly we see people use it for sleep, and then there's mood, and the mood isn't always abuse like getting high. We certainly hear about patients with anxiety saying that opioids level them, right? That they, they make me feel normal, they bring me back to a level spot. And that leveling um, changes over time. Unfortunately, that's a downward spiral, and then eventually after dependence, it becomes about staving off withdrawal, and then staving off withdrawal can sometimes lead down a path of addiction. One unmet need in the surgical community is understanding how to uh, effectively wean patients who go through a course of opioids, who need opioids for some period of time for major surgery, and then we end up because we do think that some people are avoiding withdrawal. 13% in hand surgery, 13%, this is the one slide up here, not from one study up, not from our group, from Rick Dayo, spine surgery. 4.8% uh, of teens and adolescents undergoing pediatric surgery. You should be bothered by the data, I am. 10% uh, of curative cancer surgery, and 19% of breast cancer surgery, I think our cancer exception is problematic. If I compare the 10% to the 6% on the top, the surgical incisions are pretty comparable. What's different? I think we have cancer patients who are probably willing to use opioids because of their cancer, and, can and pr cancer providers who are trying to be good physicians and probably are more liberal in their prescribing because of cancer. But I recently cared for a person who had been on opioids for 10 years for cancer cancer that had been cut out 10 years prior. And these are probably our, one of our, this is probably one of our newest studies. Um, 13 to 30 year old kids undergoing wisdom tooth extraction, something that's done three and a half million times a year in the US. 
The dentists are way ahead. They have randomized control data to say that opioids are not effective, that when you compare it to ibuprofen and acetaminophen together, opioids really don't add anything. And yet 80% of kids in 2015 still got an opioid. And after adjusting for patient factors, including demographics, pain diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses, medical comorbidities, and the impaction status of the tooth, I actually learned how they number wisdom teeth. It's 1, 16, 17, 32. Um, after adjusting for all those factors, just getting an opioid prescription was associated with about a 2.7 times risk of becoming a new chronic user. This could be like 50,000 otherwise healthy kids becoming newly dependent. Again, this is not necessarily a pure addiction narrative. This is dependence. I will argue as a pain physician that dependence is, a, is, is morbidity. If we go back to this slide, I could actually also argue that becoming a new chronic user is the most common complication after elective surgery, and yet a complication that most surgeons have not until recently started to even discuss with their patients. We talk about many risks that are well under 1% when, when counseling patients, and we have this very common risk that has been previously underrecognized and is a great opportunity for quality improvement. So um, as I said earlier, I think it's great to be in this space as compared to some of the other more challenging spaces as we relate to opioids. Because yes, of course we can, uh, we can change prescribing. So early on in our effort, we, there wasn't a lot of data, there wasn't a lot of energy around this, and we understood that number one, to be able to go around the state and the country and talk about opioids, we needed to be able to know what was happening in our own house. More importantly, we also understood that we couldn't go too fast because we, if we lost people along the way, another, not lost patients, but lost surgeons, we, we have a bad outcome, something happens that is dissatisfying, this could lead to you know, big problems and we would struggle to engage. So we put our med student who I termed, uh, Ryan Howard is an M4 with tenure, I'm pretty sure. Um, he was so exceptional. He's now one of our surgery interns, one of the most exceptional people I, I've interacted with. And what he found was that when he looked at lap coli at the University of Michigan, 50 pills was the average prescribing after lap coli. Now, I saw some big eyes in the audience when I said that. Let me bring you back. This, is, this predates 2017. I looked at the Truven data for 2017. First half of 2017, the average number of pills is still about 42 pills. So for those that are in, we have a like-minded group here. Many people in this audience have already thought about changing their prescribing. You've probably already changed your prescribing, but if you go out into the real world, there's still some real prescribing going on. So 42 pills is still an average. Now, some of you have seen these data, but some have not. 50 was the average. Any, any guesses on how much people actually used? Seven's a pretty good number. So 10 was the mean six was the median. 15 pills would have satisfied 75% of people, and again, we were early in our effort and we didn't want to be too aggressive, and even though the data were skewed, we said, you know, let's just do this. If we could go from 50 to 15, that would be a considerable change. Let's do that. So Ryan Howard did a, 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 a voiced over PowerPoint. Um, our chair made, our surgery chair had all the residents watch this video, and sure enough, over the next 370 patients, 15 pills became the new average with a very tight confidence interval. And what I don't show here that's also cool, and we, I, I don't know if it's out yet, but the, we, we have a, a, a new publication that's either out or, or in press, um, there was a spillover effect. Now armed with data, the residents started changing their prescribing for lap api, thyroid surgery, lap bariatric surgery. They needed context. We talked last night, a few of you said, well, how did I come up with 40? I don't know, somebody taught me 40. And so I prescribed 40, and then I taught it to somebody else. Well, now we've given them data, and they've applied data broadly. There was no change in refill rate, 4% before the intervention, 3% to follow. No change in self-reported pain. And when we gave people less pills, they took less. So the median went from six to four. Now, okay, Chad, that's two pills. How big of a deal is this? Well, let's project this out more broadly. What does that look like now in spine surgery or knee replacement? And I had Ryan rerun the data a few times, try to adjust for other factors. Was this simply ibuprofen and acetaminophen were being better used? They were not. Those were still opportunities for improvement. We're not doing a great job there. It turns out that this is a well-described social psychology construct. This is called anchoring and adjustment, right? I'm sure every morning you wake up and you have uh, bacon, eggs, sausage, um, yogurt. I don't remember what else was out there. I'm sure you do that every morning, right? When you're giving people more, 
you're conditioning them to take more. I don't think everybody believes opioids are like candy, but we're in an antibiotic era. Take all your pills. I take the green one in the morning, the blue one in the afternoon, and I take two of the white ones at night. Well, what are these for? I don't know. I take a blue one in the morning, the green one in the afternoon, and two of the white ones at night, right? How is this different? We are, we, it is very confusing. I have a, a friend who's a, a social psychology PhD who just had shoulder surgery, and he sh showed me his packet of papers, and he and his wife, who's also a PhD, struggled to understand what to do for his pain. That's at the University of Michigan, where I think we're trying really hard to do good things, and that's only a few weeks ago. Just lots of opportunity for change. This, we are conditioning people to take more pills, and we give them more pills. So let's think about the context of that. 370 pills, uh, 370 patients, 35 pills less per patient. That's like 13,000 pills, not the community. That's a really good opioid drive. I know Jonah's going to talk about opioid drives today, but that's a big day. 13,000 pills, not in the community. One surgery, one institution. Now, many of you are aware, but for those that are not, Michigan is structured uniquely as a state. We have an unfair advantage. I will show the example of the MSQC, because I know Jim's going to talk about music. Um, but we have all 73 hospitals engaged, coming together, uh, funded by Blue Cross three times a year, four times a year. I have been going to these meetings for years, even pre predating Michigan Open. Not sure what we would do, but just mesmerized by the structure. And so uh, when Jen and Mike and I came together, we, we, we went to Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and said, let us use this unparalleled structure to get real world prescribing and understand what people are actually taking. So real world prescribing recommendations. There's a lot of single center work happening out there and I think it's terrific and a void of data single center work is the right thing. But we wanted something that was representative of every hospital and every patient type. Moreover, let us use this platform to avoid the seven to 10 year lag that exists between discovery and dissemination. Let us disseminate. And so these were our first recs. Don't take a picture because they're not current. But we put these out, October 2017. These were the first evidence-based prescribing recommendations after surgery. 35 hospitals. Uh, I got a lot of feedback on Twitter that they were too high or I never give this. And again, I'll come back and say, you are one of the groups that is um, ahead. Um, I know somebody tweeted, my terp don't hurt. I don't, was that you? It might have been you. My, my terp don't hurt. But, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I think that... Um, that I, I, I completely agreed with everybody that, that these were still too high, but they represented anywhere from a 50% reduction to a two-thirds reduction of what was actually happening in the real world. And they were evidence-based and people wanted to get behind them. As compared to policy, five-day limits, seven-day limits, policy makers coming in and saying, you have to do this. This was a physician talking to a physician, surgeons talking to, when we go to talk to orthopedic surgery, we don't go. I mean, I might go sometimes, but I'm always gonna bring an orthopedic surgeon with me. In the same way, we would never go to music without engaging Jim or Dave Miller. We would always engage these people because it's important. You have to hear from your peers. You're gonna hear that today. So we believe in this CQI model. This is one you know, but we could make prescribing recs, new prescribing recs. We think that'll reduce prescribing. And based on the data that I just showed you, if we reduce prescribing, we should see a reduction in consumption. And this is where I think we've differentiated ourselves as a group is we didn't make single prescribing recs, one-time prescribing recs. We've used that data to iterate, and we've been monitoring patient satisfaction and pain. We're monitoring for unintended harm. We hear this from the community. And um, these are brand new. You are the first group to see this slide. The will come up on the website in January because we are revamping our website. These are our brand new prescribing recs. And you can see we've come down. We've come down yet again. We've also added a lot of important cases. We've added knee and hip replacement. That's a 50% reduction of what's happening in the real world for knee replacement, and it's, a, it's about a 75% reduction of what's happening for hips. We've added a number of other cases. Some of this, though, I will say is mixed. Now we're taking some single center data. And I'm not, uh, Jim's gonna talk about one of our cooler programs, which is um, a, a modifier 22 program to really reduce prescribing, but doing so in a patient-centered way and incentivizing surgeons to do this that is not represented in these recommendations. Now, I'm sitting here in front of uh, Rick Barth, who, who was the first to really describe this idea, this idea that we are vastly overprescribing. My colleague Mark Bickett at Hopkins has gotten a lot of press for this too, but there's no doubt trendsetter Dartmouth Group clearly said we're vastly overprescribing for surgery. 
If we think about what that looks like in our state, 33 pills in excess, 45 pills becomes an amazingly consistent average across surgery, 1.8 million surgeries per year. Just in our state alone, that could be 62 million unused pills each year from surgery alone. And this matters. I, I go back, again, I, I go back to stories. I, I go back to Becky Savage in, in, in South Bend, who lost two of her four boys on the same night, graduation night. They drank, took a couple pills, drank a couple beers, and they died. And what was different about the introduction, my colleague, a general surgeon who introduced me, I had heard many stories, but he said, I, I knew I hadn't cared for them, and I knew I hadn't cared for their kids. But I wondered in that day, when I read that in the paper, these two very well-loved boys in this town, was my excess prescribing associated with those boys' death? Did that lead to the pills that were in that party? I mean, if you think about what this would look like in our state, this would have been better had we won uh, a couple weeks ago. <laughs> but this is what 62 million unused pills just from surgery look like, and we'd have to borrow part of our hockey arena just from surgery. It doesn't include dentistry or primary care. Anybody that says that we're just that that pills are hard to find hasn't done one of these opioid drives. Uh, I'll just mention that we're interested in this because we know among kids 12 and older who admitted to misusing or abusing a medication, when asked how they got their medication, it was pretty clear. 55% of them get them from a friend or family member. It's easy. 17% had them left over from their own care. Um, there's been a bunch of busts lately in our community, and you know everybody will talk about drug dealers, even doctors that are drug dealers. That's 4%. Right? It's small. I went and gave a lecture to high school seniors and juniors and seniors in, in Ann Arbor. It's an intimidating crowd. Um, and uh, I said, how many of you could go home and within an hour access an opioid? And three quarters of the kids immediately raised their hand. I don't believe that, that this community high school was, so was had three quarters abuse, but they've processed it, they've talked about it, and one thing I heard recently um, was that kids now pre-sell their leftover opioids from their uh, third molar extraction, so they have effectively a, a free market in their high schools of I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna get my wisdom teeth out, I'm gonna have excess pills, how much will you pay me for them? These are easy to get. Um, I won't go into drives in detail other than to say we've done this uh, we started in Ann Arbor, and we've now spread this out. We have a toolkit on how to host your own drive, and we have a community engagement team that actually does this work. And we, we basically worked these 60 cities through it, um, paid for some of the cities through some institutional funding and CTSA funding. Uh, we got 3,000 pounds of pills, about 3,200 pounds of pills in these 60 sites. And some of these communities are quite small, about 40,000 opioids. We see codeine dating back to 1972 and before it was 1976. These are sitting in medicine cabinets for decades. And surgery is definitely the most common reason for people to get out of their car. Um, Jen's going to talk about brochures, so I won't go into detail other than to say, I'll just reiterate because I hope you get this. We have made brochures. I know the American College of Surgeons has also made brochures. Um, di one difference is we, you can send us a high-resolution logo and we will put your logo right on the front. Within a week, we'll send it back to you. We have about 100 health systems in um, about 20 states that are using these uh, free and clear. There's no, there's no exceptions. And I'll let Jen go through those in a little bit more detail. But they do cover all the key variables. We're interested in these high-risk populations. We've done work. We have a biorepository with about 60,000 people in it. Um, this is a, a study we published looking at the opioid users and the characteristics, those people coming in. The ones that you think about initially when you think about opioids and surgery, you immediately gravitate towards that challenging patient already on opioids before surgery. And um, again, mainly with Jen's leadership, we are pivoting to this group, understanding what to do with this chronic opioid user because we know that they're, they're, um, they're sicker, they have more substance use disorder, more widespread pain, more comorbid anxiety and depression, and certainly groups like the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons see more of it. Um, more importantly, uh, I, I said our, our biorepository, which has been, our, our team has actually recruited about 60,000 people since 2012 through our perioperative setting into an opt-in biorepository where we have um, DNA samples that have actually been genotyped and QC'd. We know about 80% of those people are opioid naive, and we just received some supplemental funding to at least take a first pass at this question. Is there a genetic association between that exposure and new dependence? And I think that might tell us a little bit about biology, certainly risk, and I don't know whether to believe that this will be a risk profiling method. I certainly still think that there are simpler things that we can do in understanding patient risk, like asking people if they have a history of substance use disorder. Let's be honest, this is not happening. We're not asking patients about previous substance use disorder. Even 
what, not just opioids and, and heroin, but do you, do, you, have you, do you or has someone in your family ever abused alcohol or drugs? There are patient characters, high level stuff that I think is, is actionable today, and that's some of the work that we're starting to move into. So, so as I start to wrap up, what are, what are we doing? Well, we've talked about decreasing prescribing, but I think our bold next new steps, and some of you have already done this in your practice, is eliminating exposures and doing so in a patient-centered way that still attends to pain and functional recovery, but looking at those cases where we can eliminate exposures. I did a lecture in Seattle uh, one fall for a bunch of neurosurgeons, showed no neurosurgery data. I came back a year later for their neurosurgery conference only to find out that they had sort of done their own QI. We're writing a paper right now on how to do your own QI, right? But they had done their own QI, and not only had they reduced their prescribing substantially, like 75% for some of their simple, simple spine surgery, right? simple spine surgery, but they had eliminated prescribing from some of their really simple cases. And the PAs were so proud of that. They were so happy, and they felt ownership in that, and they were really, really proud of that work. So I think that's a bold new step. Simply reducing prescribing is not enough. Um, and I think we can eliminate new persistent use, and I think this is about transitions of care. Um, what do we do today? Well, I, I think these are the factors that you can consider today. You should educate patients. Tell people surgery hurts and that your goal isn't to be pain-free. Tell them that you can um, expect some pain and usually about how long it lasts. Encourage them to use acetaminophen and ibuprofen consistently within data sets. We see that you know, some people use acetaminophen, some use ibuprofen. Ask your patients if it would be cheaper for them to have a prescription or maybe just default to giving them a prescription and let the pharmacist work it out as to whether it would be cheaper to buy the over-the-counter. Don't send them out expecting them to go buy a $20 bottle of ibuprofen, right? Empower them, change. Not only that, if it comes in a prescription bottle, I got this feeling they're gonna be more likely to take it. Use acetaminophen and ibuprofen around the clock for 72 hours and then as needed. Be careful with benzos. There is one muscle that a benzodiazepine relaxes and it's the big muscle in your skull. It is not a muscle relaxant. Now, if a person's on a benzodiazepine preoperatively, -oper pre do not acutely wean them either. That is associated with morbidity. I hope most of you know that, but I wanna be careful in that concept. And lastly, I'm a big believer in prescription drug monitoring programs. You should know what your patient's taking. PDMPs are here to stay. If you do prescribe an opioid, please only use one short-acting opioid. I think that's probably less of a problem in your specialty, but for the orthopedics, we see people sometimes going home with three different short-acting opioids because they have their own little mental titration of oxycodone to hydrocodone to tramadol. Uh, I, I'm telling you for sure, people start taking all three out of confusion. Do not start a person using who's opioid naive on new long-acting opioids. Don't give them Oxycontin, MS-Contin, fentanyl patches, right? You wanna use short-acting opioids if an opioid is required. Avoid preoperative prescriptions. What am I talking about there? We consistently see this in the data sets. You give them an opioid uh, a prescription in the clinic as a convenience, bill this before your surgery. Well, if that person has pain of any kind, including surgical pain, we see many people starting it before their surgery, you're making them tolerant, acutely tolerant, before surgery, and we see this as an independently associated factor with new persistent use. And lastly, we do have high-risk patients, and right now um, we have a, a paper that's getting closer showing that effectively surgeons are prescribing zero naloxone. And there are CDC guidelines. I don't know where the value proposition is for more broad naloxone prescribing, but we certainly are sending people out that are high risk, and we should be not only sending them out with naloxone, but with education. So, and I, I'm bullish about this transition care. One of our medical students made this, and, and I think it's a pretty accurate schematic of what's happening in a transition of care. When that person comes back for a refill request, that they're effectively being pushed off to their primary care physician to, to, to call them themselves. We think this is a better way forward. You know, let's do good pre-op expectations. If they do need a refill, let's do an active referral, have a conversation with the primary care physician. The PCPs are gonna own this eventually anyway. So engage them in that help and let's do an informed process, but talk to them about what should be expected and empower them to say, hey, look, this really shouldn't be surgical pain at this point, so that they're not simply prescribing surgical pain. So how do we stop this from happening? I'm tired of the stories. I hate the stories. They move me, they power me, they, they make us work harder, but I think we can get data in all kinds of data, prospective data, claims data, there's many types of data that we need to guide and reward, and Jim's gonna talk about a little bit about our, our financial reward by an insurance company, and collaborate. I, I will say this, um, and I'm here in an AUA headquarters, I have seen national societies 
um, all try to own or fix this. And I think it's a problem. Small groups try to fix it. We want to take credit for it. Our group is happy to share. Our happy group is happy to give credit if anybody wants it, including our guidelines. However, we have not been successful in anyone taking us up on that offer. We have offered to even remove our logo and let a national society take credit. They respectfully decline. In an area of, in an era of uh, where, where bipartisan support is almost nil, this is a place where bipartisan support exists, and yet medical societies can't seem to come together on how to fix this together. This is an opportunity. Um, these are my colleagues. You're going to hear from Jen Walji. Mike Inglesby is a transplant surgeon, runs medical education, awesome guy, and has taught me a lot. And um, we are a growing group, and we've grown quickly in the last two and a half years. Um, and they are a hardworking group. The hardest part is getting them to go home on a Friday at 5.30. So with that, I will leave you. Um, we, the, you can go learn more about our prescribing recs, our um, patient materials up at michigan-open.org, and our precision health effort there um, as well. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. I don't know where we are on time. Do you want it? Okay, sure. Sure. Too comprehensive. Yes. So the question of dissemination and how we go bigger and, and get, especially out of states of like, that have CQI. So we, we, we admire the Illinois group, the Illinois collaborative. We admire the South Carolina collaborative. We share freely and we think that areas with collaboratives can clearly move faster. Um, but not all states will have that, nor should we sit and wait for states to have collaboratives. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot to do. I'm being here today as part of that, although I'm probably talking to a bunch of like-minded people. Um, so broader dissemination is hard. Uh, I do think there are, uh, so I'll put it out there because um, maybe somebody in the audience, there's a lot of smart people here, will write their grant faster and I'll thank you for doing it. But um, there is opportunity, I think, within continuing education. And if national societies, and I'm, I guess I'm in the house of one of your national societies, uh, uh, if national societies are serious about this opioid epidemic, uh, we should empower physicians to do their own QI get their hardest to get part four credits without ever leaving their home. And I believe that if people saw change in prescribing and saw their patients were doing well by assessing their own patients, that that would create belief. And I believe that it's a pretty big carrot to give somebody those hard to get part four credits. So I would love it, and Jim and I talked about this last night, if um, you know urology would lead here, um, helping urologists get CE credit to improve opioid prescribing and so that if you're a small town doc who doesn't go to very many meetings. So if there's somebody in the audience that really wants to take a lead on that grant, um, Jen and I will happily hand off everything and you can go nuts. Um, and we would really be excited and I, I would hope that a national society would get behind that because that is an opportunity and, and really a, 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 it could be a huge win for urology. In that vein, I'm Margaret Rooks-Stiles from Wake Forest, and I was wondering if and when and what you have done at Michigan for the medical students and graduate students in nursing anesthesia care. So it's big groups. Uh, we do a lot of education now for our medical students. Um, Mike Inglesby, as I said, is the uh, director of medical education for our medical school. We now have um, opioid, we have an opioid pain um, content. We're in the midst of making some online CE. Uh, that we'd like to make freely available for others to use for um, whatever um, they think is, that they see fit. I, I will also say that um, more broadly beyond uh, sort of medical education, uh, we've done a lot within our health system just from department to department. But um, that is grassroots, and I, I actually would empower people. I, I, I know a lot of the anesthesiologists in your department. Um, you know, doing some grassroots works there would really be the best way forward. They need to hear it from people they know, respect, and trust. And unfortunately, I just don't think um, even high-quality video content is going to be as effective as getting a chance to not only hear from you, 
but um, but also um, but also use you be able to ask you questions. And if if our slides are helpful, um, let us know. We'll give you our slides. Yeah, Chad, thank you as always for a great presentation. I just wanted to follow up on you said about um, continuing education credit. The American College of Surgeons had uh, CME credit for their on-site opioid prescribing workshop that you right. were a part of, and actually that is now available for everyone for continuing education credit and is around surgical opioid prescribing, and that can be used by anyone, anyone in the community or anything, and I, I believe there's a whole free component that, so Super. Um, there, are, there are courses that are available, and actually Chad was part of it, so Great. thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Our first session, we're going to lay out several physician-led multi-component interventions in opioid stewardship that can be disseminated and used across the country. And we know that reducing over uh, opioid overprescribing, overuse, as we know from these slides, that it requires a multi-pronged approach. So. First, we need to understand how many opioids we should be prescribing so we don't contribute to the crisis. We, don't, we minimize the exposure for patients. We also minimize the number of unused opioids. But even if we do that, we know we're going to have an issue with unused opioids. So we have to also think broadly about reclamation efforts. And then even more broadly, how do we do all of this um, on a larger scale by, by partnering with payers? So our first speaker, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Rick Barth. Um, Dr. Barth attended Harvard Medical School. He completed a residency in surgery at New England Deaconess Harvard Surgical Services. Additionally, he was a fellow at the surgery branch of the NCI. Dr. Barth is a professor of surgery at Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine, where he's also chief of the section of general surgery at Dartmouth. And he's a pioneer in the development of pro-surgery prescribing guidelines. And he's going to be sharing his research and his experience, which led to these guidelines and how they might be applied to urology. So thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, very, thank you very much for inviting me, um, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have um, doc, Dr. Um, um, Chalmers give a talk um, right before my talk for now on, okay, because that was just incredible uh, uh, how Chad kind of introduced this whole topic, and um, a lot um, of our thinking is exactly uh, the same. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to skip, you know, the first couple of my slides, basically, because it's already been, you know, discussed, and, and just kind of get into this, because I've got just 15 minutes, and want to cover a lot of stuff. So, you know, I think surgeons play an important role in the opioid epidemic. Um, we commonly prescribe opioids after surgery. And what we, we really don't, haven't been taught, again, is that, is that prescribing opioids for our patients has risks for them. Um, and that 5 to 10 percent of opioid naive patients will become chronic users after prescribed opioids for surgery. And that, and then the other problem is that the excess pills can be diverted to others. And these are things that Dr. Bunn was already, you know, sort of discussed. Um, you know, here's a here's a, a, a table of several different studies. You know, that with hundreds of thousands, really, of patients now that have um, have documented that um, patients have become chronic users. And again, I don't think none of us who were, were taught this, and we don't really realize this when. Um, and I think this information really needs uh, to get out there um, and uh, and inform uh, how we how we treat our patients. So. That initial prescription size does matter, um, that if there's a, the, a greater prescriptions, there's a greater chance that patients will have persistent opioid use. And so I think the, the way I kind of look at this is we want to try to prevent long-term use then by really right-sizing the initial opioid prescription. Um, so we started um, trying to, I just started doing this three years ago as a tumor immunologist, kind of worked at that. Most of my other research was in that field. and. I'd come home at night, and uh, and I'd just uh, my wife and I'd be looking at TV, and we just saw how many people were dying in New Hampshire all the time with this, and said, "Well, we've got to do something about it." So um, I just started, you know, did a literature research, literary literature review back then, and really there were no studies that looked at best prescribing practice in general surgery. Now this is great that you, the urologists have invited me here because I've given this talk and, and there's this article from Journal of Urology, like it's right there, 2011, you know? So you guys were way ahead of the curve, okay? So the urologists in, in, um, in this, so I 
pulled this paper up, you know, and here it is from Journal of Urology in 2011. Overprescription of postoperative narcotics to look at postoperative pain medication delivery, consumption, and disposal. You know, the University of Utah, um, almost all of them were given prescriptions. The median, mean number of pills prescribed was 25. Only about half were used. Two thirds of the patients had opioids left over, and only 8% were given instructions on how to dispose of the leftover medication. So, you know, you guys really have been in the forefront on this. Um, I think. Um, the part of the problem was, though, this paper didn't come out with guidelines, though, and, you know, the guidelines that, um, that Dr. Drummond has shared with the Michigan Open Group and other groups have put out are really critical because um, it's, it's a little hard just to, to see this data and then know how you're going to change your practice. So I think it's really important to put out guidelines. So we have um, just have a few papers, you know, that we, where we've um, uh, uh, looked at this now in both outpatient operations and in patients who are having inpatient um, surgery. And I'm just going to share just some of our work then basically with you um, with that. So our first um, studies uh, looked at our outpatient operations, mast partial mastectomies, lap coles, lap hernia repairs. Um, Basically, we, we got the, the data on opioid prescriptions, and we, we basically just called patients and asked them how many they took. It was really simple. I actually don't have any grant funding for any of the studies that I've done. Uh, we've just kind of done them with surgery residents and almost kind of as quality improvement projects at Dartmouth up to now. Um, so here we had, uh, oh, about 700 cases. We excluded some patients who were chronic opioid users, people that had painful complications, and analyzed about two, 650. And you can see that for all these um, operations that most of the patients were being given prescriptions, the um, mean number of pills prescribed was approximately 20 for the, for the breast surgeries and for about 30 to 35 for the hernia repairs and the lap coles. And the range was amazing. You know, so the range was anyone from 0 to 50 or from 0 to 100 um, uh, pills for the lap coles. And so obviously people did, didn't know how many to prescribe. So then we just looked and saw, here's, here's the prescription stuff on the top, okay? So here's for after partial mastectomies. Uh, I hope you can see this, but this number of pills prescribed is on the x-axis, and the percentage of patients that were getting them is on the y-axis, and then here's the percentage that was used, okay? So huge differences between the amount of pills that were prescribed and what was actually used after partial mastectomy. And we have very similar pictures after lap coli, the, the number that were prescribed, the number that were used. And after inguinal hernia repair, prescribed and used. Um, so in summary, only about a quarter of the pills that were prescribed were actually taken. And um, since uh, you know our publication, several groups have described overprescribing, as uh, Dr. Brahma said, in the group at Michigan have um, described this with cholecystectomy. Um, the Mayo Clinic, uh, multiple operations, including for urologists, nephrectomies, and prostatectomies. Has been this has been described, um, and at UVM also they've looked uh, at several operations, including urologic operations like vasectomies and robotic prostatectomies. And so, that data is now out there, and it's it's very clear that this is um, this is uh, has been very prevalent. So the question is then, well, how many? What's the right number to prescribe? You know, so if it's being overprescribed, so we have to figure out well, what's the right number or an ideal number to prescribe. And we just kind of simply said, all right, well, let's, let's take, um, let's say you should just prescribe enough that we take care of 85% of our patients. Um, and so this is the, for the lap coli, this is what we did here is we just took and said, put a box, that little red box around 85% of the patients said, okay, let's just prescribe 15 for those patients. And so we did the same thing with the other outpatient operations we looked at, and we came up with this ideal number of pills in the bottom or our guideline. Um, then for partial mastectomy, it was 5. Partial mastectomy sentinel nodes, it was 10. Um, lap coles, 15. And the hernia repairs, 15. And that was, you know, le about half or so the median number of pills that was actually being prescribed um, uh, in the past. And in fact, this was our sort of first cut at this. And I can tell you in the last year and a half, I haven't prescribed any opioids to any of my breast cancer patients. Okay. So, you know, it, um, so it's, this has changed too. It's a living document, you know. Uh, I agree. Also, and this is, you know, it's just a couple years old, but I mean, this is this has even changed. So anyway, so that was our new, um, that was our guideline, um, you know, and uh, and that would lead to about a 57 percent decrease in the amount of opioids that were prescribed. So what do we do with this information? So basically, I just went to the, you know the group at Dartmouth, and um, I had section meeting. I, you know, I'm the head of uh, general surgery, so I called the other surgeons in. Told them about this. We sent emails out. We had a resident teaching session, 
had to do a lot of other teaching with nurses and, 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 the, and uh, you know, that were discharging patients from surgery so that they understood what was going on. Um, and then, um, and it, along with showing them this data on how much actually patients use, basically recommended using acetaminophen and ibuprofen first, and then opioids, just it's sort of a different concept, but it's obvious, you know, from huge reviews like the Cochrane reviews that the combination of ibuprofen and acetaminophen um, is really more effective than just a, a single opioid alone. Um, and so we did that. We reset patient expectations um, uh, with regard to, um, you know, how many, what they really needed to have, you know, what their pain was going to be like and how they could take care of their pain. I told them I've been studying this and you really don't need, you know, 30 oxycodone um, for prescriptions. Um, so anyway, that, that kind of went out and then we basically, I just observed what happened, okay? So for the next uh, four months in the same operations, we basically collected data on opioid prescriptions and opioid use and found that just telling docs, you know, giving them a guideline and, and, uh, and, and informing them dramatically changed the number of opioids prescribed. So you can see that each of the operations is on the left here and you can see the mean number of pills before our education and after dropped dramatically for all five operations. The median numbers dropped um, dramatically also, and, uh, and the ranges were much tighter um, from what they had been before. So, um, so just, just educating um, surgeons and providing this kind of framework could just dramatically change the amount of prescribing. So there was actually a 53% decrease in the number of pills prescribed. So you might ask, well, what are the pain medications needs of the patients met? So, you know, I spoke to the nurse in my, in my clinic and I said, Lori, I said, you know, we're, we're cutting down dramatically the amount of opioids we're prescribed. You might get a lot more phone calls, you know, and just, you know, let us know. And Lori was like, Rick, you know, I haven't, haven't gotten any phone calls, you know, basically. And in fact, we were still meeting all the, the, the pain medication needs of these patients. So these patients, only, only one patient required an opioid refill. And um, we also observed that when patients were prescribed less, that in fact, they still took less. So still we were over prescribing. So here we were prescribing half the amount we were prescribing before, but only 34% of the prescribed opioids were taken. So um, that has to do with that, size, that sizing picture that Chad was talking about earlier too. So, um, and we did record, you know, how, how many of the, the, uh, the um, non-steroidal, so, you know, ibuprofen and acetaminophen patients were used. So if, here's the data for the partial mastectomy patients. And in fact, we got all our partial mastectomy patients to either take Tylenol or, um, or ibuprofen. Um, only about 40% took both, so we, we still have room to, to uh, improve, I think, on this. Um, for some of the other operations, um, uh, our numbers weren't quite as good as this, but, um, you know, there's, we, can still, we can still improve uh, with regard to using non-opioid uh, analgesics. Well, the next thing we started looking at then was how many opioids were prescribed for patients who are having inpatient um, uh, uh, surgery, so they're going to be in the hospital for a while after their, their surgery. And, you know, all in New England, we've got laws that limit the number of pills prescribed to a seven-day supply. But I always thought this was kind of ridiculous because if you're the surgeon who's writing these prescriptions, okay, how many, what is a seven-day supply? Is it, is it uh, 21 pills because they're getting one every six hours or is it 84 because they're getting two every four hours? You know, do you assume the patients will use less pills every day? Is seven days the right number? Is it five or is it 10? Who knows, right? So, um, we started, you know, looking into, you know, how many, how many pills should you prescribe someone who's been admitted? So we looked at six common inpatient operations, um, gastric surgery, liver surgery, pancreas, colon surgery, big hernia repairs, studied 300, over 300 patients, um, and then basically, um, and, and got results back from about 90, about over 90% of these patients. So we, we basically sent them, we sent letters and then, um, and then also called all these patients. So we had a pretty really good, I think, uh, um, uh, results from our um, finding out how many they actually used after. So we broke our analysis into two groups. One um, group was discharged on post-op day one, others who were discharged on post-op day uh, two or greater. And we basically, in the groups that were sent on home, day, home on day one, we just looked at their home opioid use again, but then the people who were discharged on post-op day two or later, we hypothesized that the number of pills they took the day before they were discharged is going to predict how many they're going to need at home. You know, this is no, no really brilliant thing or anything, but I thought that that was, uh, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So here's the data from patients um, who were discharged on post-op day one. Um, so you can see that um, uh, they're, 
about 15 pills will pretty much take care of about 85% of those patients' needs, and this is really didn't matter what operation they had. So, you know, here's where I was asked to talk about procedure-specific opioid prescribing, you know, and a lot of the guidelines are for procedure-specific um, uh, prescribing, and I think that's certainly relevant for outpatient operations, um, but for people who go on home post up day one, it really didn't matter. Um, and, and that's what we found also then when we looked at patients who were discharged on um, post-operative day two or later, um, is that um, we did a multivariate analysis of factors associated with home opioid use and found that the number of pills taken the day prior to discharge was really the best predictor of how many were used at home. Um, and, it was and the opioid use at home was independent of the operation performed. So here's our data for patients who didn't take any opioids the day prior to discharge. Um, you know, they were all prescribed with opioids. They were prescribed opioids so that they could take them at home, and 85% didn't take any when they were at home. If they had taken one to three pills the day prior to discharge, then here's the data. So 85% would take, uh, if you gave them 15 pills, it would satisfy the opioid um, sort of needs of 85% of the patients. And then if patients were taking four or more pills the day prior to discharge, and this is just a five, it's the same as a five milligram oxycodone pill, it was, they were all sort of normalized for that, then 30 pills would take care of everyone's, um, everyone's needs. Um, we, uh, and in fact, we even, we looked at the patients, the outliers there too, and said, well, what was up with those kind of patients? You know, so we called them and, and I said, well, why were we using them? And I didn't bring the slide on that, but over half of them were using it for non um, procedure specific pain. So they're using it so they could go to sleep or they were using it because for some other reason or they said, well, the surgeon prescribed me this, this many so I thought I was supposed to take them all. It's kind of like this, you know, you're, you, your mom tells you you should eat everything on your plate kind of thing. So, um, so that was why they were taking them. So I'm not worried too much about that 15% of patients that, you know, are outside of our, our, uh, our guidelines uh, um, uh, and how many they're going to take and worried about them coming back. And, so here's a simple, very simple guideline then. Okay, um, anybody can remember this. Um, so uh, if you know they're going home post-op day one, you just give them 15. If they're going home on post-operative day two or greater, just look and see how many opioid pills they took the day before they were discharged. If it was zero, you send them home with none. If it was one to three pills, you send them home with 15. If it was four or more, you send them home with 30. So um, this was, again, retrospectively generated data. We currently have a prospective trial going on um, at Dartmouth to try to, uh, to verify this. Um, this guideline. So if uh, our guidelines were used, you'd cut opioid prescribing by about 40%. So here I am, we're talking to the urologist right now, right? So, uh, you know, how many opioids should you prescribe to your next uh, urology patient? Well, I mean, you could use our guideline then if someone's an inpatient, um, uh, you know, for two days or more and uh, basically use this guideline that I just described to you. Um, there's also, um, you know, sort of, uh, there, there are also uh, guidelines that are out there for, um, you know, operation-specific consumption after discharge. Um, you know, there's, the, as you just saw, there's the Michigan Open Guideline. There's a nice guideline from the group at uh, Mayo Clinic um, that uh, is available online also. Um, you know, I tried to just, um, because I'm just talking to you guys, I basically tried to put together at least some of the data. There's um, data from the Fuji papers from UVM, University of Vermont, um, and then the Fields papers from, um, is from Mayo, and basically just kind of put together some of the urology operations um, and tried to look at, you know, sort of what's taken um, in those studies, you know, that, that looked at use, um, and you can see there for the various, some of the operations you guys do and what the interquartile ranges are and the ranges and, you know, kind of come up with at least a little bit of a guideline there. Um, and I, so, uh, uh, you know, this is this is what you can fill you know fill in the data with. This I was speaking with the um, sort of the New England Urology Association, and I think there's some really nice data on this. Is also coming out. I believe the Mass General Group they presented an abstract at that uh, at that meeting as well. So I suspect there'll be more more data really uh, really recent coming out for you guys. So a, a potential barrier for surgeons though prescribing less opioids might be concern about patient satisfaction scores. You know, so we've got. Um, Hawkeye Pierce on our staff um, at Dartmouth. Um, he's one of the trauma surgeons, and um, his focus has been uh, when he's, you know, he finished in MASH, and then we, we kind of recruited him to Dartmouth for a while, so uh, that's not going over so well. All right, so anyway, <laughs> um, he's, um, uh, so he has a certain number on our website, you'll have stars, okay? So it's, if you, 
pull up anybody. We'll have, he, so he's got three stars, and there are comments, all the patient, read patient comments, too, and saying that Dr. Pierce had a great sense of humor, but he didn't give me enough pain medicine after my operation. You know, so surgeons can be worried about this, right, that their sa patient satisfaction scores are going to go down if they don't prescribe enough opioids. So, you know, so we, we looked at this a little bit. Um, we looked basically then at uh, two different periods of time, one where period A, where we were prescribing a lot of opioids, and then period B, where we had cut our prescribing to less than half. And basically just said, okay, let's look at provider satisfaction scores over those, those two periods of time. So also we had 11 surgeons who were in, group, in the two groups, and we, um, the data is, is actually um, collected by the Press Ganey company for, um, for Dartmouth. So it had a, a totally independent company was collecting this data, and, the, and it was actually anonymously being uh, sort of pers um, uh, given by the patients. Um, and what we found then, if we looked at the providers from time frame A to time frame B, that there was absolutely no difference in their provider satisfaction um, uh, scores between those two periods. So I think you can feel confident that if you just appropriately prescribe opioids, you know, and, and set patient expectations and have discussions with patients about um, their, their opioid needs and, um, and let them know that you care about their pain, you know, and, but that, and, and you care so much that you're not going to prescribe them a whole bunch of inappropriate opioids that you can still have really good satisfaction scores um, and prescribe less opioids. All right, so uh, again, I think this is going to be discussed um, in, uh, in, in uh, talks later on today about the excess pills. Um, so I think um, I'll just kind of end on this then. Um, you know, in, in 2017, the number of opioid prescribed, prescribed pills prescribed nationally decreased by 9%, and um, I'm uh, sort of happy that New Hampshire was the top state in the nation with a 15% decrease in opioid prescriptions. So thanks very much for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Jennifer Robles from Vanderbilt. Thank you so much. I've been following the Dartmouth work for years. Um, I had a question about basing your guidelines off of the number of pills that patients were getting in the hospitals because where I trained at Washington and St. Louis, we found that with PRN narcotic orders, which is I think what most of us use, that often when we went in, we asked patients, you know, who seemed like they had very low pain requirements, oh, you know, according to the MAR, you got, you know, five of Percocet what happened, they'd say, oh, well, the nurse just gave me a pill, or, you know, I said I had some pain, and they had Tylenol ordered, they had ibuprofen ordered, but yet the nurse brought them, you know, the Oxy, and then they took it. And so we had to do a lot of patient education to our patients, but alternatively, you could do it to your nursing staff also, to say, hey, you know, when someone's trying to give you a pill for pain, like, ask them what it is, and if it's a narcotic and you're not in severe pain, like, say no, just say no, you know? Um, and I was wondering if you had, if your team had done anything like that, either for the patients or for the nurses. Right. Well, it's, it seems um, you know, if the patients were being given those pills, it would it would overestimate what they need to go home on anyway, right? So yeah, um, and and I agree with you. There's a lot. I think there's sort of a culture in nursing. Well, you want to take this pain so before the pain gets worse, so that it doesn't get so bad that we're not able to control your pain. And I don't really, I don't think there's a lot of basis in that. Uh, you know, so but that's been. That's one of those things that's been taught, just like we've been taught that people can't become addicted, you know, by giving them, um, you know, pain for acute pain from surgery, et cetera. So I think it's something that's probably a fallacious teaching that's gone over time. But you're right. I, you know, we have, I don't do PRN, uh, Tylenol and Ibuprofen. I just it's scheduled Tylenol and Ibuprofen now for all my patients pretty much unless they have some uh, contraindication to the use of one of those. And and then I, and you talk to your patients and just say, you know, again, only use this if you, you know, if you really need it and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it, everybody needs education on this, absolutely. Because I, especially, and especially the nurses, because I'd be sending patients home with no opioids, and 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 the nurses say, well, well, they'd talk to the patients, say, hey, what, you know, you don't have any opioids. What's the matter with this? What's the matter with you, right? And they'd call me, you know, and I'd say, and then so I said, all right, I just have to get everybody together, you know, have a big discussion with you. the opportunity to return to Dartmouth as an alumnus for a long time ago. You do use opioids to care for my relative who has just had Tylenol Demerol done to him. And it turns out that one of the drawbacks of this is that you get hit with this uh, long term abuse potential. Are we really talking, when we use the word opioids, are we really talking about new agonist opioids or the specific class of opioids? 
have you guys lumped them all together, or are we really talking about the few in the middle? Oh, I guess I tend to um, to lump them together a little bit. Okay, I think um, the most it's uh, probably um, oxycodone and and um, and Vicodin are the most common ones that are, that we're using, you know, these days. So. Um, Yeah, well, I think people are using tramadol a lot more. I'm not, you know, as a very weak opioid. I'm not so sure how that kind of work is going to work into things over time. But yeah, thanks for that point. Hi, my name is Anna Zampini. I'm a resident at the Cleveland Clinic. My last year in urology. I was really struck by that slide as well, looking at the medical record and what was prescribed versus what was then, like what the patient took in house and what they were prescribed. Mm -hmm. Because I think now in the era of enhanced recovery protocols, at least we've heavily adopted those. And so we're using very minimal opioids in the inpatient stay. Yeah. However, we're still routinely just prescribing them opioids to go home with. And I think there's a big disconnect yeah. there between what they actually use, what we want them to use, and what we give them. So I think that's a great opportunity for us to explore. It is, yeah, exactly. So a lot of the patients that were in the study are on enhanced reco recovery programs. You know, so our you know our colorectal group had been you know doing that for many years and all. Um, uh, I think it gets it's a little you know it's a little complicated. Like I sent a patient of mine had an epidural in. I did a liver resection on him a couple of days ago, and he had an epidural in and was going home. And the epidural was just sort of stopped that morning. You know, so you feel a little worried that uh, you know the epidural was taking care of some of their pain. You know, in that 24-hour period beforehand. So I think that that does have a little bit of an issue on this, but, um, but, uh, but I, think, um, I think this is gonna hold, hold pretty true, actually, and I think we're way over prescribing, especially those patients that don't take any before they're going home. Uh, Tim Everett from uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Hi. Really enjoyed your talk. Thanks. Um, I think you and, and Chad both made great points before about not equating prescribing with patient satisfaction scoring, mm -hmm. but I think you have to also tailor that with the concept of the education, speaking with the patient, it's not just a one-off. Because um, you know, I know certainly in emergency room settings, even maybe more so than uh, post-op settings, if you're just change your prescription habits, but don't yet have a conversation with the patient, how to deal with breakthroughs or you know issues like that, I think it's a, it has to go part and parcel. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I've since I've been doing this, you know, I normally would talk to my patients when I'm seeing in the office, you know, before their surgery about what to expect in terms of complications, et cetera, after their surgery. Well, now I have a conversation with everyone about, you know, well, what to expect for post-operative pain management, you know, and I sort of go over with them, you know, exactly what we're going to do. And I said, yeah, and in fact, we've been kind of researching this, and, you know, we're, we're, we'll base it on how many you take the day before you go home or, or whatever, or like if I put my breast patients, I'll just tell them, you know, we've been studying this, you don't need any, you know, and so... Setting that expectation goes a long way. It, you know, I think it's really, really important. That's a great point. Okay, thanks. Hospital. He earned a PhD in health services research with a concentration on epidemiology and biostatistics and a master's in public health in, pol uh, in public policy at Case Western. He joined the Surgical Outcomes and Quality Improvement Center at Northwestern in 2015. He's currently the director of the opioid reduction efforts and runs a video-based learning collaborative for the Illinois Surgical Quality Improvement Collaborative. And today he's going to discuss the second prong of these multi-component opioid interventions, which is opioid reclamation. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm going to use the, that poll everywhere thing. So get out your phones. That's how I was trying to tell everyone. And they're like, why are you waving your phone like a crazy person? Um, how do I... Click here. Does this work? All right. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have several grants that run through the um, uh, Illinois Collaborative to do opioid reduction work, and I do the technical skills stuff with Intuitive. So um, totally unrelated to this. So do you currently advise 100% of your patients? Are you sure that 100% of the time you tell your patients that they need to dispose of their leftover pills um, when you provide a prescription for an opioid? Who can say that they honestly do that for their patients? Or at least have a very good system and process. Is this working? Anybody? It's not actively? It's working? Hmm. Okay. People are learning. 
I threw a few questions in by, by request, so I'll give a, a minute or two and then, oh, show, uh, <laughs> someone else is in the, in the slides, good work. Okay. So you 16% of group, you are way ahead of the curve and that's wonderful, so congratulations. Um, next question. It's probably concentrated uh, in the Michigan Dartmouth table. Next one is, do you offer drug disposal within your surgery clinic? <clears throat> All right, so you guys, uh, a big part of urology is clinic-based, right? I know my urologists see like three times the number of patients that I see in their clinic. Um, they have multiple rooms going. It's a huge uh, part of the care of urologic patients is uh, being in the clinic. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, great. So we have some people who are currently offering it within their clinic. Show, show of hands, who, uh, who is that that has that? That's, that's wonderful. Where, what states are you in? Oh, Michigan has it now. You guys finally, finally, all right. Where, Wisconsin. Wisconsin has it, that's great. Dartmouth, North Carolina, and California. That's awesome. So across the country, you're able to do this. This is possible, okay? So if you don't know how yet, hopefully I'll show you a little bit about how, but you can do that. So if you don't offer it within your clinic, how many of you offer it uh, in the, just somewhere in the uh, hospital? And again, I think Chad's point was right on. I mean, this is, this is wonderful to see, but we have an activated crowd, right? We have a, a, a self-selected crowd of individuals who are very interested in opioid reduction, and still I think we're very early in this process. Um, So this is great, okay. And for anyone who's in Northwestern in here, you can say no to this because our generally, um, although we've been hard on that for probably three years now. So it's not the easiest. And the very last question is, what percentage of your patients appropriately dispose of them? So, okay, so now you all are doing a, a, a great job of, you know, a good percentage of you have put a, put a box in your clinic. If you haven't, there's a good number of you have put a box somewhere in your uh, hospital and you know it at least exists. So the last piece of the puzzle is that, that means we're all talking to people about it, right? And we know offhand how many people um, are disposing, right? Unfortunately, I think I meant to add a button in there that says I have no idea. Um, I, I guess I, I left that one off, but I think, um, I think it's fair that the number of people answering is probably a little bit lower. And um, just for the sake of time, we're, I'm supposed to end at what time, guys, so that I'm on? In 15-ish in minutes, okay. So I'll move quickly for the sake of time in our, our last speaker, but um, I think what, what you're clearly seeing is, is a reflection of what the data shows too, is that very few people throw it away. And, um, you know, I think it's really important for us to think about the fact that we are here in a little bit of a bubble, okay? For one, most of the room is urologists, um, with the exception of a few extra folks who've come in. Um, and two, we're really concentrated on this problem. Um, but I want to tell a quick story, and that's how I got into this um, field originally, and it was uh, summer of two and a half, I guess two and a half years ago, so it's like 2016 in the summer, and I was just talking to my mom about this grant that I was writing and how I was really interested in this topic, and she goes, oh, well, I have opioids. <laughs> I said, oh, you do? She said, oh, yeah, so in March of this year, I had to get this little procedure done on my thumb, and I said, oh, well, tell me about this procedure. She said, it was great. I um, went in. I, uh, it was a plastic surgeon, they were doing something to my thumb, and they had this like tourniquet or something on me and this screen up, and I talked the whole time, it was great. I was wide awake, couldn't feel a thing, um, have this splint on, it was fine. When I walked out the door, I was given a prescription for 30 pills. Okay, pretty standard, right? I mean, we do this all the time, procedures across the country. We have all these multimodal things that we do, you block, the hand, it's totally numb, she didn't get any narcotics, she, she probably had an anesthesiologist in the room, but it doesn't sound like they gave her enough because she remembers the whole thing. Um, and, you know, they basically didn't, they probably did the procedure more or less narcotic-free. Then she says, well, and then in April, 
which is three months or three weeks later, right? Ish. Um, she had a dental procedure. She had for a long time had this tooth that needed, she needed a post or something. She complains a lot about that procedure. Um, she had it done not completely under local, but I'm sure they injected something locally, right? So they had multimodal analgesia. And then as she was leaving the um, dentist's office, she was getting her prescription for another 30 Percocet. So for those who are uh, math inclined, the numbers up there, she's already up to 60. But that didn't end there. Her next procedure wasn't that long after, it was just in June, okay? And in June, she went to a podiatrist. Now, I forgot to mention that um, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. So much like Michigan, and we're right in the Rust Belt, we're right in the middle of this problem. We actually live uh, about an hour outside of Cleveland, Ohio. There are plenty of people in our community who are suffering with the opioid abuse. Um, there are high death rates in our local community. So this is the, you know, arguably one of the areas that's the heart of the problem. And this was 2016, this is all over the uh, popular press. So the, the issue is out there. But she has this toe procedure and again, the whole thing is done under local anesthetic. She's awake the whole time. She never used a narcotic during the procedure. She had something done on her toe. For her, it was kind of irrelevant. She had to wear a boot and that frustrated her. But she got another prescription for 90 pills. Now I ask you, how many pills do you think she used? Right, this is before I was going around talking about this. This is before a lot of surger, surgery groups were talking about it. But it was certainly available in the, you know, the popular media that opioids had a problem. Who thinks she used about 60, about two thirds of them? Right, so for everyone who's paying attention to the thing, you probably know it was probably about a third, right? So she probably used about a third, 30, anyone? No? 15, who thinks 15? Okay, a few handfuls, 15. What does everybody think then? Why is everybody not? Zero, right? She took zero. She didn't even, she picked up the first bottle and then she didn't even pick up the other two bottles. She didn't even realize like why she got the prescription. She's like, I have these other ones. But she at least had the potential to have 90 pills just sitting around in her purse, walking around, okay, for no reason. And if she wasn't, she was actually, she's a nurse, um, uh, and she was like, oh, I took Tylenol and ibuprofen, I used ice. And I asked her, how many of those physicians told you to take Tylenol and use ibuprofen and use ice, and not a single one did, okay? So it's not just a problem of urology, it's not, I'm a general surgeon, it's not just a problem of general surgery, it is a systemic cultural problem across the board. So when we see some of the data that has been previously um, shown about how prescription opioids and opioid sales and opioid deaths are, it, and this is just CDC data plotted from the 90s forward, kind of went in line with the, uh, what was going on, we need to be able to draw a plausible connection. We can't just say, okay, we have two lines. We know there's some causation there, right? We have to say, how might these two lines be related? And it turns out that there's good data to give a very straightforward walk between when we prescribe and have excess pills and they go to uh, use and abuse or non-medical use, okay? And the first um, graph that you see on the screen left there is a consistent curve. It doesn't matter which particular paper I happen to put up there, right? You see the same curve over and over again. People tend to use few and then they taper down. The wonderful talk that we just heard showed this curve over and over again for multiple procedures. In Dr. Brummett's talk, over and over he showed a curve that looked very similar. And then the data on the right, the only thing you need to know, you know, it's a little blurry, so that's fine. The only thing you need to know is the gray is just borrowing from friends, okay? So what does that mean? That means that it doesn't matter which procedure this is, it doesn't matter where, what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the non-medical users if you ask them where did they get their pills, the majority of non-medical users aren't getting them from drug dealers. And they're not necessarily getting them from pill mills either, okay? They're getting them from their friends and family, either borrowing them, buying them. As Dr. Brumman alluded to in schools now, it's very easy to get them. But this is the overwhelming driver in non-medical use and people are getting it is clearly um, simply from the excess that is available in the community. And a sobering statistic is that if you ask heroin users, 75% of them, and actually the number keeps changing, so I just keep sitting with 75% because every year it bounces a little bit, but 
the CDC data here says that 75% of heroin users, when you ask them, they tell you that they started with use a non-medical use of prescription drugs, okay? So a lot of um, those who end up, not necessarily in your urology clinic, but in the addiction clinics or in the emergency rooms, a lot of them started with non-medical use. And so in 2016, in the grant that, uh, the NIH grant, what we're studying is um, how do we implement multiple changes across the spectrum to change that culture, to change the problem that we see of non-medical use of drugs, but then also leading down this path however they get there, whether it's your patient, your patient's family, your patient's family's friends, or your community. How do we prevent them from going down the path that we're, we're so uh, now aware of can lead to death? And so I really think that if I'm gonna talk about reclamation programs, I have to put it in context of everything else. If you just say, hey, people throw away your drugs, what you see is the majority of people is zero to 10% of people will actually throw away their drugs. So most people, that's not the culture. It's not our culture to get rid of things, right? We all have addicts full of stuff. It's not, it's not normal. So it starts by changing the whole culture within your clinical practice. And so we talk about it, we have this minimizing opioid prescribing and surgery program, it's comprehensive, it talks about many of the things you're gonna learn about today, like the importance of expectation setting, the importance of risk screening, the importance of optimizing function. And I specifically put it on top of the smiley faces because we have a whole thing around, you shouldn't be talking necessarily about pain, you should be talking about optimizing people's function. You have to manage their pain to optimize their function. They have to be able to get up and walk. They have to be able to deep breathe. In my world, I do abdominal wall reconstruction. They have to be able to breathe. They're gonna get blood clots, they're gonna get pneumonia. But that doesn't mean they should be pain free and they should be you know, a green smiley face or asleep and pain free. And then lastly, the thing I wanna to talk the to most about in the remaining time is we need a closed loop between this concept of we know that opioids whether you're prescribing 5, 10, or 50, we know that the, the drug itself is a dangerous medication. That's why it's a Schedule II medication, okay? We know it has high addictive uh, properties. So we should think about prescribing those medications differently. When we prescribe them, we should think of it more like a contract with the patient, that we're providing them with a medication that we know has higher side effects than other medications like Tylenol and ibuprofen or other methods for pain control like ice and mobility. Okay, we know that, but some people still need them, especially for certain procedures. And so we'll still, we still may be prescribing them because it's a tool in our tool belt, but we have to have a closed loop concept of prescribing. And this has borne out throughout Northwestern's medical system through multiple work um, streams. I like to show this because I think a lot of the people in the audience are here either from academic centers or hospitals that have electronic medical records or other things. And these are the work streams that we use to actually implement them, to actually get people to change their behavior within the system. And at the top there you have safe disposal, so making it more publicly available, putting that uh, kiosk in your uh, main entryway, putting one in your clinic so it's part of your discussion, okay? Providing patient and provider education opportunities, optimizing your EMR. We've built all those numbers into the EMR. Now it doesn't matter, your default when you go through your order set is part of it. And one of the things we've done to our hospitals within our hospital collaborative is if you have Epic, well, our analysts have like written out the code and said, here, give this to your analyst and you can play with it, um, make it fit for your order set, but you can just put it into your Epic system as well. And we were talking to Epic about trying to just get that so that they could share it, so that anyone who has Epic that wants to, you know, adhere to the Michigan Open numbers, um, that they can. And we currently just use the Michigan Open numbers because we think that's some of the best data out there. And then lastly, we provide measurement and support um, to feedback to our physicians. So hopefully everyone in this room has heard about the prescription monitoring programs that exist in all states except Missouri. Um, and you know, they are an important piece of a comprehensive puzzle because if you think that people um, aren't getting prescriptions from other sources, you're wrong. People are getting prescriptions from lots of other sources, so it's important for us to check um, and just make sure that when we ask a patient, and first of all, we should be asking the patient, and second of all, we should be double checking to make sure that um, we understand the information that's uh, truthful, that's coming through. Next is I really believe in electronic prescribing. I think it's really helped our practice. Is anyone in here still uh, doing paper prescribing of narcotics? So a few, okay. This is brand new at Dartmouth. 
I mean at uh, Northwestern, brand new. We did not have paper prescribing until March, or electronic prescribing until March of this year when we had to upgrade our EMR and have certain security. So it's not available everywhere. That made it much easier for us to talk to our physicians and help them change the quantities because they felt a little bit more comfortable being able to provide a refill if they needed. And as many people have already said, most people didn't need it, but that doesn't mean that the physicians, when you ask them to change their behavior, don't say, oh, my patients are different, they're going to need it. Um, and so I, I've really felt that that's been an important step. And then the other important step is putting something very visible and making it part of the comprehensive conversation and part of your clinic. So this is the box that sits in our clinic, okay? When you come into the surgery clinic, it's right there in the front. So before you even have your preoperative visit, you see that it's there. There's a little sign that says, you know, dispose of unused medications. There are lots of other ways of doing it. So we use the one that's on the left. It just happens that that particular vendor already had a contract with our institution, but there are others out there. Um, there are also these like um, envelopes. So there are other ways of doing this, but integrating the conversation about getting rid of medications as part of prescribing the medications and what to do with them afterwards, I think is critically important. And I know Jen will talk about, um, you know, giving the patients that information as well. And we really believe in that too. We have a pamphlet that we've been giving out for several years that talks about safe opioid use, but then it also talks about disposal, safe storage, why it's important to keep those safe in your um, home. Now all this information, there's no way we could, it, any of us could get, you know, I live and breathe this like uh, eight days a week. And so there's no way we could get all of the information that we're trying to get out to everybody um, through a 15, 20 minute talk. And so one place I'd like to point you to is we also have a website. We have a opioid stewardship um, toolkit, which is freely downloadable. We do the same thing. We, we fully believe in unbranding it. Uh, we have other collaboratives and other groups who have taken many chapters of this and just download it and either put it into their own toolkit or just take the toolkit and put their own brand on it. We have hospitals within our collaborative who take it, just put their hospital logo on it and then just hand it out to everybody in their hospital, uh, within their hospital quality structure. And I just wanted to make one comment about our toolkit. We have the print version, but we also have electronic components. So we have built nursing education modules that talk about how do you talk to a patient when you're an inpatient? How do you talk to them about stepwise in, uh, incremental um, pain control? Why it's important to use Tylenol? Why it's important to use ibuprofen? We have the same thing that's a pharmacist module for all of our pharmacists, and we also have a physician module. So we have. Um, modules that are already built. We make those freely available. We give them out to folks that have their own LMS. So if you have a learning management system within your hospital and they are, you already do these educational things, um, we have a module that's built to go into your LMS. You can put your own wrapper around it. It could say, you know, Emory or whatever your hospital is, you know, ha is offering this education. And you can just drop that into your LMS. We're also trying to make it available just on our isquick.org website. Um, so with that, if you'd like any more information about all the work that's going on or get any of our tools, that's, my email is up there. I could not be up here talking today if it weren't for the incredible work of a huge team um, that's putting in a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, and so thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to present, and uh, I'll take questions. Appreciate it. Uh, are, do you guys have any ex, uh, ex, experience right now with uh, the home kits, like the Tylenol fifties or anything like that? And you doing that in your health system right now? So um, we don't, because within our health system, we're trying to get people to bring them back and throw them away and dispose of them in a, a EPA friendly way. We have two of our hospitals that are uh, St. Francis hospitals, so that's uh, St. Joe's and St. Francis, that have chosen to use that, and we're collecting information on. Uh, whether more people use that than our other methods. Um, our early data says that about 20% of people throw away their pills regardless of the way uh, you do it. If you just have a conversation with them, ask them, beg them, remind them, and give them the opportunity, about 20% do, um, which is a humbling number. We'd like to get that higher. Just checking the mic. All right. All right. Well, with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.
Um, I just wanted to, to let everyone know that we actually built in some wiggle room for time at the end of the day. So um, I know we're running over a little bit, but I think it's important to have discussion. So uh, we will make up that time later. So don't worry about it. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to present our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jim Dupree. Uh, he's an assistant professor in urology at the University of Michigan. He received his medical and master of health, public health degrees from Northwestern, uh, and he completed his urology residency there as well. He has an advanced fellowship in male reproductive medicine and surgery at Baylor, and he was also named the 2017 AUA Gallagher Health Policy Scholar. And today he's going to speak of the value of partnering with payers to facilitate clinical in innovation, such as opioid stewardship, how this can effectively reduce opioid use statewide and beyond. So. There you go. Great. Um, thanks so much. I want to make sure that the lapel mic is working. Can folks hear okay? All right. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to present today. Um, it's obviously an honor to be invited to, you know, the headquarters of my own professional organization. Um, and uh, this is obviously an incredibly important and timely topic. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip my first two audience response questions, but don't worry, we'll come back at the very end and you'll have a chance to let us know how many pills tomorrow when you go home, you're going to start prescribing for your patients to get a prostatectomy. Um, I was invited here in large part because of my role as part of the much larger Michigan Neurological Surgery Improvement Collaborative, or MUSIC, um, that many of you hopefully have heard about. And for those of you who have not, um, I'll tell you just a very briefly what MUSIC is. So MUSIC is a statewide collaborative quality improvement organization for the state of Michigan. Um, it is funded by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. And as Chad alluded to earlier, we admittedly have um, a unique advantage in the state of Michigan because of how large Blue Cross Blue Shield is in terms of the state. They are willing to invest quite heavily in physician-led quality improvement organizations. And that's at its core what MUSIC is. MUSIC is a community of urologists with 44 practices. Over 90% of the urologists in the state are part of MUSIC. Um, we also have patient advocates that are uh, structurally and fundamentally part of the organization and keep us, keep us very grounded. We collect data at what started as data just for prostate cancer patients and now is extended to patients with, uh, with kidney stones, ureteral stones, and most recently, small renal masses. And the talk today is really going to be about the work that we've done in the prostatectomy space, of which we have over 10,000 radical prostatectomies that, have, that are uh, included in the registry. And this is a registry that is directly chart abstracted at each individual site. Um, and so it's quite robust in terms of the data that we have in music. And so, um, you know, obviously we in the music, in the, in the uh, music community, um, we're trying to figure out, you know, how can we continue to reach our mission of making Michigan the number one place in the country for urologic care? And it was clear for all of the reasons that our excellent speakers earlier to this morning have already outlined that opioids were a big issue. Specifically in the state of Michigan, there were several things that we noticed happening that we thought we could really jump onto. Um, the organization that Chad and Jen run was obviously one of them, that's Michigan Open. And then the state itself also started having some new uh, legislative initiatives that were going to change the way we as physicians prescribed our opioids. And so we thought this was the right time kind of for music to jump into this, to this space, again, to make Michigan the number one state uh, in, the, in the country for urologic care of all kinds. Um, one of the things that we wanted to know is kind of like, what, what was our history? Where were we coming from? And so this is data that was generated uh, actually uh, with the help of, of the uh, MOPEN team that told us from 2012 to 2016, how many prescriptions were, how many uh, uh, pills were patients filling after they left the hospital for a radical prostatectomy? So across the x-axis in this graph uh, are hospitals in the state of Michigan. The y-axis are the number of pills here made to the equivalent of five milligrams of hydrocodone or a five milligram Norco um, were patients filling when they went home. And so admittedly, there were some patients that may not have filled a pill, but regardless of those who filled, this is the size of the, of the pill prescription that they filled. And so what you saw is a range of anywhere from eight pills to 180 pills at the patient level. And the mean was that after a patient left the hospital, they were filling about 40 tablets of five milligram hydrocodone. So that's a lot. And so obviously, we knew we could do better. So one of the questions always is like, well, how do you do better? And um, there are sort of always, there's carrot models, there's stick models. And in the state of Michigan, we had, again, admittedly somewhat unique opportunity, but one that I think can be applied elsewhere to partner with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan to help create a structure and an incentive program in the state 
that really got people moving towards an opioid limited pathway after a radical prostatectomy. I think we all know, and actually the speakers this morning have done a tremendous job already showing us that it's more than just the doctor making a decision, him or herself, how many numbers to write on the prescription pad. It's about what kind of infrastructure is built up in your clinic to talk to these patients before their surgeries, what kind of education do you do for whomever receives the post-operative phone calls to know how to handle that call. I think the question in the, in the last session about kind of the nurses on the floor, um, how do you educate the nurses on the floor to make sure that their messaging is aligned with your messaging? So there's a lot of work that goes into changing this. And what Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan said is, why don't we recognize that work? And why don't we say that if you as a surgeon can organize your practice and your environment to do the extra work required to reduce the opioids, we'll actually pay you more for it. And as actually Chad mentioned last night uh, when we were at dinner, there's, there's very few things happening in medicine in 2018 where someone's willing to pay you more for something. Um, it's much more about taking money away. And so I think this is something that understandably has caught people's attention. And the mechanism that they proposed using is the moderate fire 22. And for those surgeons in the room, you probably have all used this before. And it's something that we can use whenever we feel like a surgical case that we performed took more work than the typical patient. So a patient that was particularly obese, a patient that was be, being reoperated on, a patient whose prostate was so large it couldn't fit in the bag. Um, you know, whenever you really need to be doing more work than usual, you have the opportunity to do this. And what Blue Cross said is they would be willing to let you use a modifier 22 for the extra work required to reduce the number of opioids that we are doing in a manner that's safe for patients and you know, good for the entire health system. And what they were willing to do is started in six pilot operations and radical prostatectomy was one of those six. So spurned in large part by this policy change, you know, we in music created with the help of MOPEN and others in the, in the state and in the community, what we're calling you know, pop music or music pop, which is a pain optimization pathway um, uh, for a radical prostatectomy. And um, in coordination with Blue Cross Blue Shield, Blue Cross did say, like, you can't just, again, reduce the number that you're writing. You have to build an infrastructure around that to make sure that patients are being cared for appropriately. And so part of the pain optimization pathway is preoperatively, you're expected, if you're going to get this modifier 22, to counsel patients about pain expectations and pain control. We've, we've created some handouts, again, that we're willing to very happy to share as well that are specific to radical prostatectomy patients. In terms of what happens in the OR and what happens on the floor, there were no sort of structural mandates or changes that you had to do as a result of this modifier 22. You could continue with your normal intraoperative and in-hospital care pathways, although there's an encouragement to consider you know, non-narcotic uh, pain control strategies. This is really the crux of what this modifier 22 kind of uh, pathway was about, was about what happens at discharge. And the agreement was that when the patient went home from the hospital, they would get a prescription for no more than six tablets of the equivalent of five milligrams of oxycodone. Um, you could do five, six tablets of tramadol if you wanted. I know some people have strong feelings about tramadol or six tablets of hydrocodone if you wanted, but no more than six tablets. And the goal was that of all of your patients over the course of a year, less than 10% of them would need a refill. So it acknowledges that some patients are going to need a refill, but hopefully it's, it's uncommon. And then after discharge, there is an expectation, again, that there was sort of monitoring of your patients in terms of how they're doing. Are they, are they miserable? Are they safe? Are they OK? And again, how much were they using and how much were they uh, meeting? And so you know, we in music, spurned on by this policy change, talked to the entire collaborative about it and said, hey, we have this opportunity to partner with Blue Cross to improve the quality of our care and get the resources needed to build the infrastructure for it. But of course, the collaborative had some really big questions. Naturally, the surgeons in the state of Michigan said, slow down for a second, is this going to work? Like, what are my patients using right now? What are my patients being given right now? Is this going to harm patients in any way, shape, or form? And these, I think, are really important questions because it's, you know, we don't want to be making a big policy change that ends up hurting patients in the end and the, or that falls flat. And so what we in music did, and this is sort of the crux of the data that I wanted to review with you here, is we decided to leverage the existing patient reported outcomes infrastructure to answer those questions that the surgeon in the, in the state naturally had. And so um, music since, uh, well, actually for about three years now, music has been uh, doing patient reported outcomes about urinary incontinence and sexual function and general health after a prostatectomy. Um, and what we did is at one month, we added some standardized questions about 
how many prescriptions were your, how many opioids were you given, how many did you consume, and prescriptions both before and after surgery about what your pain control was like so we can make sure that patients were still being well cared for. And so patients were given this questionnaire at baseline before their surgery, patients were given this questionnaire at one month afterwards, and then so they could tell us sort of what their actual experience was. And here's the data. And so this is, again, we started this in June of 2018, so this is all still pretty fresh off the press. Have a few more than 200 patients that have responded to that one month questionnaire. And at least from June of 2018 through about October of 2018, we know that about 87% of patients were prescribed an opioid at discharge. So that's good. So about 13% of patients said they weren't given no opioids. That's great news. And about 87% were given an opioid. And for those who were given an opioid, what were they given? Most of them were given what looks like either Norco or uh, Vicodin. So some combination of hydrocodone and acetaminophen. Um, there was about 20% or so that were given tramadol, maybe 15% that were given oxycodone, and then a smattering of other um, more rare prescriptions. So this is what patients were being given, again, sort of as this modifier 22 thing was being discussed, but not yet statewide. Here's the amount that they were being prescribed. And so um, the histogram here shows you across the x-axis the number of mor uh, morphine milligram equivalents, which is just a way to standardize different types of opioid strengths uh, so they all can be put on the same graph. The y-axis here is the number of patients. And so what you see in blue is a histogram just describing how many patients were given how many of these uh, moral morphine equivalents. Frankly, this graph looks a lot like what Dr. Barr showed us earlier. And then not surprising you, my next slide's gonna look a lot like what he showed us earlier. But what we saw here was that patients were being prescribed the equivalent of, of about 15 Norcos or Vicodins or the equivalent of about 10 oxycodones. So when we asked them what they consumed, Here's what we found. So they were consuming significantly less. So they were consuming the equivalent of about six hydrocodones or the equivalent of about four oxycodones. And again, the goal for this modifier 22 pathway was for patients to be, be given a prescription for six or less. I think what we were reassured by here is that the median patient was taking four oxycodones. And so this was doable. And frankly, this was really before the program was even fully rolled out and implemented statewide. And so we were pretty encouraged by this, that, you know, and this answered those questions of what are my patients being given right now? What are my patients consuming right now? Um, and then the next question is, you know, how many of them were going to need refills? And so when we asked this initial group, how many of them had called back for a refill? About 7% had asked for a refill, which looks to be kind of a relatively in line or maybe just a touch higher than some of the data that's been shown already here this morning. Um, but again, this was sort of the, the baseline survey really before the implementation of the statewide initiative to improve this. But again, we thought this goal of having less than 10% of patients get a refill was pretty doable based on what we were seeing already. And when we asked patients at 30 days if they were still taking an opioid, about 2% of us told us they were. Um, and so, you know, a little bit on the lower end of the scale of what we saw from other surgical procedures. We don't, again, it's just 200 patients. We don't have a great sense for how robust this number will continue to be as our survey numbers grow. Um, but still, this was, you know, kind of in line. And it does tell us that out of 200 patients that got this survey, four, there are four men in the state of Michigan that were continuing to use opioids, you know, at a month after surgery. And that's important. Uh, when we asked them why they were taking it, they all said they were taking it for pain related to their surgery, but hearing the presentations this morning, it makes me wonder if we should go back and tweak those questions to allow like a, like a more than one answer and ask about sleep and anxiety and some of the things that the speakers mentioned this morning already. So then the other question is, well, like, were these, were these guys in a lot of pain? And so on the left is what you see is a graph of pain at baseline. This is pain before surgery. The x-axis here is that typical zero to 10 pain scale. The y-axis is the percent of patients saying that they had that much pain. Frankly, I actually thought the left-hand graph was really stunning to me. And so when I said before surgery, how many patients were having pain? I mean, there were, you know, 5 to 10% of patients that were having 5 out of 10 or more pain before surgery, which, I don't know, maybe you all sort of would have expected that. I, frankly, was a bit surprised by that. But at the same time, I was kind of reassured that, frankly, the graph on the right and the graph on the left look pretty similar. So on the right is 30 days post-op. Those curves are, are, I think, very similar. So we're not, you know, as patients are taking less opioids, this does not appear that they're reporting significantly more pain at 30 days. So, you know, what do I hope people can take away from this? And I think, you know, one of the first things as we were talking about this a little bit at last dinner last night is people said, well, like Jim, like, you know, not every state has a payer like Blue Cross that is one, kind of as big as they are, and two, is willing to engage in this. Like, 
how in the world does this apply to me? And, and I think really some of the data that Chad showed this morning about the costs associated, the downstream costs associated with patients that become chronic opioid users or persistent opioid users can really be motivating data to have a conversation kind of with any, whomever it would be that would have the appropriate um, incentives to lean into this with, some, with you. So whether that's your, whether your hospital that you're in also owns or runs their own health plan, you know, I think they would be very interested in finding ways to reduce downstream costs associated with patients who become uh, persistent, op new persistent opioid users. Whether there are maybe a handful of large insurers in your state who could maybe uh, come together on this. One of the things that we've come to learn, and, and I'll show you in the subsequent slide, is that you know, even though uh, surgeons in the state of Michigan will only be getting this modifier 22 payment incentive um, for their Blue Cross Blue Shield patients, they tend to be implementing their practice changes kind of agnostic to the type of insurance that a patient has. So if someone has Aetna, or you know, if someone has United Healthcare, they're not giving them 30 pills, they're giving them the same six pills that someone from, with Blue Cross has. So if, you're, if you can have a conversation with a payer in your state, this is a model that would certainly be worth considering. Um, the early lessons that we learned is that there's a lot of stakeholders. There's a lot of people that need to know about this. Again, I think that question about nurses on the floor earlier was a great example of that. You know, patients can't be told by the nurses on the floor that um, like there's something wrong, they forgot to give you opioids. Um, and so you gotta have a conversation broadly. And in particular, it's important to over communicate those expectations with the patients. And so at least at Michigan now, patients are kind of told this by their surgeons before their surgery. They're told about this in their pre-op seminar that they all are supposed to go to as well. And then they're told this and reinforced after surgery. And then again, the other lesson that as I just mentioned is really that it's most useful to implement something like this agnostic to payer um, because practice change is often easiest when it's done universally across the practice. So where is this kind of gonna go next? Um, so uh, we are continuing to work with the state of Michigan really through um, Jen, Chad, and their group at uh, M Open to consider expanding this to other urologic procedures. Um, the goal for adding vasectomy, a high, volu high volume procedure for urologists uh, with the goal of that being that again opioid free with this modifier 22 addition. And then ureteroscopy, another high volume one, but one where there can be complex pain needs for patients that have had stones and especially acute stones. So uh, now's the one time I am gonna just use this just for the sake of time. So I guess, you know, based on this entire morning session that you've had here, my question for you is on Monday, when you go back and if you're a urologist and do a radical prostatectomy, uh, you know, how many opioids are you gonna give your patient come Monday when you discharge, when you discharge them from the hospital? And I didn't get to ask the before question for the sake of time, but regardless, I think this is really the key point is kind of what are you gonna do tomorrow you know, based on your participation here today. Great, so we're looking at kind of less than 10. So when we look at the 40 pills, at least in Michigan, that we used to be giving patients, 10 or less would be a pretty dramatic improvement. And so, you know, we have resources as well that we've um, created to support this program in the state of Michigan that we'd be happy to share with anyone that's interested. Um, a big thank you, obviously, to kind of Blue Cross Blue Shield, who's an incredible partner for us. Um, the entire music coordinating center, of whom I could not list all their names on this slide, there are so many, but they are the people that really make this work, and it's the surgeons, their practices, their administrators, the nurses, the schedulers in the offices across the state that are truly making this happen. Um, and obviously, thank you to the M Open team from whom you've already heard about from two of the three leaders today. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you all very much for the invitation to be here today. Our issue, as you alluded to, there appear to be complete resistance from the payers and payers of this. And I know you had mentioned a few suggestions um, as to how to proceed, but do you have any other specific guidance as to how we can try to just catch their attention yeah. and get them on board? So um, I think it, a lot of it is probably about like where are the incentives? Um, and so what are the things that would sort of be most motivating to them? And again, I don't, 
I don't know personally the kind of leadership of the of the Pennsylvania insurance companies, but um, you know, I suspect a lot of what the things they think about are kind of what are the premiums they receive and what are the costs that they have to lay out for claims. And I would imagine that um, being able to articulate quite clearly, you know, the cost savings of avoiding one new persistent opioid user is something that could be quite motivating for them because, again, a typical insurance company, as long as you know, is going to be on the hook for everything that happens downstream afterwards. And so. Um, it is admittedly a change of a perspective from an insurer. It's about spending money up front to, pre to prevent money being spent down the line. Um, but I suspect at least that that is kind of the angle that, that kind of Jen and Chad and their team took when they were talking with Blue Cross about it in Michigan. And I think that's an angle that would hopefully work for other employers or insurers in other states. So Jim, I'll just say we, we, we have looked and we have modeled cost of new persistent use. Again, Jen should be speaking, but she sort of lost her voice. Um, she, we, we've looked at inpatient, outpatient, whether we categorize as patients having complications or not, and there is an adjusted increased cost, and it's quite substantial over that 90 or, or, or 365 days after surgery. Um, so I think showing that kind of data to a payer can matter. Um, our payer, I think, has always been forward thinking, and Penn already knew it, right? I, I think they started out thinking about like new, new uh, addiction, so if you're young, and healthy, and you become a you you develop new opioid use disorder. Your cost of care increases by about four thousand um, percent, but that's probably not the right narrative. The narrative is really about the cost of care, ER visits, utilization, uh, not only for the payers but even for your hospital administrator. So, uh, th there's certainly the, the data are coming, but we'd be happy to share in advance. Hold on, that wave is good for left hand. Um, question. Yeah. Um, since I do a little payer and provider work, what do you think the 22 modifier program is going to cost, like actual money? Yeah. So um, uh, I don't actually know that I have that numbers for kind of prostates in the state of Michigan. I'll tell you the, the way it's coming through from a financial perspective is that for each case that Blue Cross receives the bill on, um, they are paying 35% more for the agreed upon fee for that case, the professional fee to the um, to the um, uh, uh, to the to the surgeon and, and, and her or his practice. So, for example, at Michigan, I think we're doing somewhere around, like, I think our ballpark is we do about 100 prostates for Blue Cross a year. And so it would be about a 35% increased cost, at least to the to University of Michigan, for um, uh, their prostate alone. Now, when you scale that to the six other procedures that were part of the pilot and the multiple other procedures that will be part of the expanded program, um, I admittedly don't know. Jen and Chad, I don't know if either of you, now I'm getting shakes. So I don't think we really know. Um, but uh, I think if we, if you took the number of cases and included 35%, you could probably estimate it pretty roughly. Uh, Bloom, Bloomberg, one of the Bloomberg journals uh, wrote us, and, and they did a back of the envelope estimate. and. Uh, it's, it's substantial, per, per, but they sort of looked at it at a per provider basis, not so much what you're talking about, which I think is the right way. What does it look like? And we know that over time that that incentive will go away as, it yeah. as practice changes. It's a practice changing incentive that will be short-lived. So um, about 95% of these are uh, uh, lap robotic prostatectomies. So we didn't pull out the opens. Um, they're mixed in here, but they're 5% of the data. Great. Well, thank you all very much. All right. Well, thank you all to the three speakers from the first part of our day or session one. Uh, we're going to now move into our second session. And again, we're kind of motoring through without formal breaks, so if people need to step out for a minute, please feel free. Um, this next session, which is entitled Understanding Postoperative Pain, is actually a session I'm personally really excited about. Um, we have three speakers, none of whom are surgeons or urologists, which I think is tremendous uh, opportunity to learn from colleagues with uh, different expertise than some of us. I think our, our first session highlighted some phenomenal efforts, many of which were led by surgeons. Um, and I think, you know, surgeons identify problems and they cut it out. Uh, and I think that's largely what many surgeons have probably rightfully done in, in this um, area. 
But you know, the true source of the problem is probably somewhat lies in insufficient training, education, understanding of other options for how to address this problem, which is why I think there's going to be a lot of value, hopefully, in, in our three speakers coming up here to sort of share some of their expertise on perhaps alternative strategies we can use to facilitate better understanding about pain and how to manage it and hopefully provide us with some more backup beyond just, sir, you're not getting any pain meds. Um, so, uh, as a result, I'd like to introduce the first speaker of this session, who is Brooke Chidgey. Uh, Brooke is an assistant professor of anesthesiology at the University of North Carolina. Uh, following her residency, she completed a fellowship in pain management at Wake Forest University, and that's her clinical focus. Uh, Brooke's actively involved in collaborative research with multiple surgeons and urologists in North Carolina, uh, working to reduce the impact of perioperative opioid prescriptions and also the overall impact of the opioid crisis. And today we've tapped Brooke actually for two talks. Uh, this will be the first one, and she will now speak about uh, the pathophysiology of pain and its management. Thank you. <laughs> 